Hey everybody, tonight or today we are debating universal common ancestry and we are starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for another epic debate. This is going to be a lot of fun, folks. But first, I want to let you know, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, we are a neutral platform that strives to host debates and discussions on topics including science, religion, and politics. So you name it. Sometimes even once in a while, you know, the old Bigfoot debate, stuff like that. So we really do run the gambit here, but want to let you know, no matter what walk of life you are from, we really hope you feel welcome, folks, and we're very serious about that so welcome no matter who you are where you're from and want to let you know as well a couple of housekeeping things for the channel before I introduce our moderator for today basically if you have not heard folks we are thrilled about this new strategy you could say that we are putting together namely we are for the first time ever this is the first time we've ever done it we are using Kickstarter to help fund a debate with guests including Dr. Michael Shermer, New York Times best-selling author, as well as the editor of Skeptic Magazine, and Inspiring Philosophy. This is going to be an epic one, folks. We really do want to let you know about this in that we really believe that this is going to be a big one. And so if you have not seen this, it is linked in the description. What we are doing is basically, this allows us to take bigger risks. Some of the speaker fees out there, and hey, it's well-deserved. These are busy people. They have opportunities all over the place. And so we think it's, it's well-deserved. We have no complaint about it. But we're like, hey, if we're going to start taking bigger risks, having bigger people, and even doing in-person debates with bigger people in terms of these people, like I said, New York Times bestseller, Michael Shermer, and others, is that having Kickstarter allows us to take bigger risks with those honorariums that we are paying to the speakers or the facilities that we might book for those speakers. And so if you have not yet, we encourage you to pledge to the Kickstarter as that is going to make this debate possible. We are determined, folks, I don't care if I have to do a car wash in January. I will make sure we reach the goal for this Kickstarter. We're going to make it, folks. And so I want to encourage you, it's just three bucks to watch it live. It's like a cup of coffee, folks. So anyway, we are excited about that as we, like I had mentioned to the speakers before we got started, guests such as the epic ones we have today, including Dr. Fuzrana and Jackson Wheat, are the kind of guests that we would like to have debate in person as well. And so, like I said, this new strategy will help us get there. So we are very excited. I want to kick it over to Erica. She will be sharing what the format for debates or today's debate will be. She also has her own YouTube channel linked in the description. She is, as we say, YouTube's favorite daughter. We're glad to have you back, Erica. The floor is all yours. James, it's always a pleasure to be here. You know I love to come on Modern Day Debate and help mod, especially when we've got interlocutors like we do today. I know Fuzz and Jackson, they're both a delight. And the best part about this for me is I get to kick back with my water and my Cheez-Its and listen to an awesome discussion and not have to do any moderating other than timekeeping because I know these guys are going to keep it ooh super chill, which is what we love to see. Um, so the format today is going to be roughly 10 to 15 minute openers um, as as you guys know, both James and I are very flexible with regard to uh, how, how long we um, kind of let the speakers do their openers because we just love to hear the openers. Uh, followed by about an hour, so 50, 60 minutes of open discussion. And then everyone's favorite, the Q&A. So you're going to want to tag a modern day debate with those super chats and general questions. As usual, we tend to give the super chats preference. Uh, so if you, oh, you're just dying to get a question on one of these guys, you help out the channel. You, you give a little donation and get your question answered. Um, so I'm going to pass it to these two so that they can introduce themselves and then we'll hop right into these opening statements. Um, as usual, when we do the opening statements, I try to give a warning at about 12 minutes just so the, the folks who are giving the opener know where they're at time-wise. Um, so I'll, I'll just wait for an organic spot to interrupt and be like, hey, you're at 12 minutes and then you continue on your merry way. So guys, introduce yourselves. Tell us, tell us about... Um, who you are and what you do. Oh, and one thing I want to add too as well is just that before, if you guys want to share about your channels, in particular what people can expect to find your links, I, I do have, we wanted to do this well in terms of I had I'd spoken beforehand and uh, I wanted to get to read these guys' 
introductions, which we have written up over here. Namely, so I'll read this on behalf of Fuzz and then over to Jackson Wheat. But for Fuzz, thanks so much for being back again, Fuzz. In particular, Fuzz is the Vice President of Research and Apologetics at Reasons to Believe. He is the author of several groundbreaking books, including Who is Adam? Creating Life in the Lab, The Cell's Design, and Humans 2.0. He holds a PhD in chemistry with an emphasis in biochemistry from Ohio University. So thanks again, Fuzz. Actually, we'll, we'll do it right now. If you'd like to share, what could people expect to find at your links? And thanks so much again for being here, Fuzz. Yeah, well, if people just want to learn about uh, reasons to believe in the types of materials we produce, I would invite them to visit our website, reasons.org. And then uh, we've got a new project that we started at Reasons to Believe where my friend Steve McRae and I, who have very different worldviews, get together and we agreed to argue on a wide range of different topics. And uh, coming in January, I, I'm not sure the, the date off the top of my head, I should know this, our publicist is going to really wring my neck, but uh, mid, early, early to mid-January on a Wednesday, uh, probably the second uh, Wednesday in January, we're going to be talking about the uh, topic of hell. So, uh, Steve is going to offer a, a non-theist's perspective on the concept of hell, and then I'm going to uh, engage that perspective from a, the standpoint of a, of a theist. And we're bringing on board as a guest, um, a friend of mine from, who's a professor at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, Ken Keithley, to, to join in the conversation. But anyway, I'd invite people to check that out. It's at Agree to Argue as the YouTube channel. So anyway, Absolutely. And I have agreed to argue linked in the description as well, folks. Folks, if you're listening to this channel, if you're here at Modern Debate, odds are really good. You'd love agree to argue. So do check it out. And I saw you guys are coming up on a thousand subs and that was fast because that's a, a new channel as Fuzz had mentioned. And so you guys have to check that out. Absolutely. People are digging it and also want to let you know quick intro for Jackson Wheat, who we've had, he's, you could say, a veteran here at Modern Day Debate. We've had him numerous times, including his classic debate with Kent Hovind, uh, the old, uh, the olden days. But we also want to mention that Jackson Wheat has a popular YouTube channel as well. Over 5,000 subscribers now, and many people are enjoying this debate channel, or I should say this, uh, you could say, well, I'll let you explain it yourself, Jackson, but I want to let you know, folks, what that his channel is linked in the description and then Jackson please do share what people can expect to find at that link and thanks for being here. Oh well thank you for having me. Uh, my videos are predominantly about evolutionary biology and uh, combating creationism although not as much as other channels who combat creationism. I more like to look at evolutionary biology from a positive angle uh, what are the origin of different groups of organisms, the origins of different genes and, and functions and things like that. That's what interests me. That's what I'm going for uh, in my college career and ultimately my, my profession. Uh, and so, yeah, if you like any of that, I also host discussions on, on my channel too sometimes. So yeah, go check all that out. I also have a book, The Rocks Are There, which I co-authored with RJ. I know he'll, he'll be plugging it in the side chat. Absolutely. So thank you so much. And thanks for letting me jump in there, Erica. I, I, uh, I forgot some of those details to mention beforehand. So thanks for your patience. Channel. Hey, you, you gotta, if you gotta commandeer the ship, you gotta commandeer the ship. Thank you very much for your flexibility. And what we will do is we're going to now kick it over to Erica as the speakers will be off to the races in just a moment. Thanks again, Erica, who, by the way, Erica, congrats as well. Just crossed over 5,000 subscribers is linked in the description. So thanks so much, Erica. The floor is yours. Hey, yeah, we, we did cross 5,000 subs. So thanks to everybody who uh, who did that. My videos are, are mainly about um, human evolution, primates, uh, zoology, paleontology, things like that. So if you're interested in that, feel free to sub um, since we're all shilling anyways. <laughs> Um, before before we begin, uh, just just you know, gonna let Jackson know that everyone is complaining in the chat that no one can see you. You're you're shrouded in darkness as if you were some kind of uh, key witness. I have poor so, lighting, uh, yeah. poor lighting quality, and also there's the sun behind me. He's so. he's getting. See, so you gotta you gotta be more strategic. I don't have a light on in the room that I'm in. I'm ooh, this is all natural lighting, baby. So that would require turning around, which. I, I don't want you guys to see the rest of my room. So. No, no can do, Jackson. That's I'm a I'm a Jordan Peterson. Like, hey, you know, you can just see the one end and it looks okay, but 
you can't see the rest. Sorry. Uh, Jackson, you gotta, you gotta do you. I think personally, I think it adds to the mood of the, um, of the, ooh, the, the uh, seriousness of this discussion that will inevitably be <laughs> hardcore and not at all civil and fun. Oh, um, I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> I like Dr. Rana. It's not like I'm talking to Nephilim free, so. <laughs> shots fired um so i i I, that's all i've got to say i mean holy cow me and me and james we're we're, we've got the dream team going on here we've got everything covered so i'm gonna knock it over to you uh jackson since you were taking the affirmative and um i will start on your i have a slideshow i can screen share yeah 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 yeah. and i'll I'll just start on your first word and again i'll let you know when you're at about 12 minutes but i you guys are awesome at keeping time so okay give me one sec My computer is slow, so you'll have to forgive me. Oh, please. Can I, you I, see it? Yes. We can. Okay. Come on. Come on. I can see it's trying. Like I said. It's doing, it, it's doing its best. Yeah. May, as Ken Hoven says, I need to evolve a better computer. So. <laughs> we, oh, Kent. Oh, Kent. Goodness gracious. Maybe I can do it differently. No, they never work when you want them to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, close that. I'm just going to do it this way. Okay, let's just do it that way. Okay, it doesn't matter. doesn't matter. All right, I didn't open the porn link, did I? Okay, all right, let's go. (laughs) Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you again, James, for having me on. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh... So today's topic is universal common ancestry. So we must ask the question, is it reasonable to think that all organisms are descended from a common ancestor through the process of evolution? Now, both parties of this debate need to define to what extent they accept common ancestry to pinpoint where exactly we disagree. Otherwise, how could we have a debate if we don't know where the disagreement lies? I have debated this topic with other people before who accept some degree of common ancestry, but not universal. For instance, They will readily say that they do not accept common ancestry between very distant groups, such as plants and animals. But when I press them to draw the line between any taxa that demarcates the related from the not related and how they come to this determination, I do not get an answer. And this is a common feature for all anti-evolutionists so far, not just old earth creationists, but also intelligent design advocates and even the young earth creationists whose baromenology tries to draw such lines but stumbles at the edges by leaving out relevant genetic and fossil data that would have blurred the lines. Now I've talked to Dr. Rana before, however, I'm not entirely sure what his stance is on the relatedness of different organisms beyond recognizing that he isn't convinced of universal common ancestry. I understand he believes humans aren't descended from Australopithecines, though we are separated by very little in terms of morphology. However, he and many other anti-evolutionists are perfectly willing to concede much larger and more distantly related groups of organisms as being related by natural common descent. This is the inconsistency I want to focus on today. My presentation today will involve showing a series of slides and asking where Dr. Rana believes natural relatedness begins and ends. My hope is that during the discussion portion, we can address at least some of these phylogenies together. If we can't provide a consistent metric by which to differentiate divinely created kinds, types, or whatever you want to call them, then I see no reason by which we can't simply extend the same logic that leads us to believe disparate groups of organisms are in fact related by natural common descent. This is what Arn Ra calls the phylogeny challenge, and to date, I've never seen an anti-evolutionist successfully respond to this challenge. Oh, Lord. Okay. All right, the first version of this challenge involves some arthropods. My question is, are butterflies related to horseshoe crabs? These two are about as far apart as one can be while still being an arthropod. But I also have here a series of arthropods that are more closely related to butterflies than they are to horseshoe crabs. Are they all related? Are all butterflies related to each other? Are butterflies related to moths and other lepidopterans? Are they related to flies, wasps, and beetles who all go through the same stages of metamorphic development? Are these all related to other insects, such as praying mantises and silverfish that all have a head, thorax, abdomen, and three pairs of jointed legs? What about barnacles, ostracods, millipedes? Are any of these related to horseshoe crabs? If your answer to all these questions is yes, then you accept that the entirety of phylum arthropoda is related. However, that means you should also accept humans being related to chimps, 
since our common ancestor with chimps lived only 6 million years ago. Meanwhile, the common ancestor of horseshoe crabs and butterflies lived over 500 million years ago. If you accept all those arthropods as being related to each other, then how about these? Calentia, Anomalocaris, and Opabinia are known as stem arthropods because they possess some of the characteristics of true arthropods, but not all of them. Some might even call them transitional arthropods. Two of the major diagnostic characteristics of true arthropods are that they have a chitinous exoskeleton and jointed appendages. Like true arthropods, Calentia has a fused head shield and Anomalocaris has jointed limbs. Opabinia has compound eyes. Aishea is a worm-like animal with repeating limbed segments. And because of this, researchers consider it to be near the velvet worm arthropod divide. Is it related to Opabinia and true arthropods? Or what about Yelingia? It has no legs, but is segmented with, with each segment bearing three lobes like later trilobites, which remember are true arthropods. Is Yelingia related to true arthropods? Or let's flip to the deuterostome side of the tree. Are jawless fish related to acorn worms? Anaspis, gemoiteus, and lampreys are considered true fish, while metaspergina is a true vertebrate, but isn't very fishy. Meanwhile, zongzaniscus is an advanced chordate, but not a vertebrate. Pacaya is a primitive lancelet relative, and sacaglossus, an acorn worm, along with echinoderms, are the next closest relatives of chordates. All these animals share in common deuterostome development and bilateral symmetry, as well as a number of hox genes. We share that in common with elephants, robins, lizards, frogs, sharks, lampreys, tunicat larvae, lancelets, acorn worms, and echinoderm larvae. If the aforementioned characteristics are sufficient to conclude that we are related to everything within our phylum chordata, then surely the same criteria is sufficient to conclude that we are related to acorn worms and starfish, though they nest outside our phylum. Now on to worm phylogenetics. In theory, is it biologically impossible for there to have been a common ancestor of Nemertians and annelids? Is it genetically impossible for one lineage of ancestral worms to develop any versible proboscis and rhynchocele, as in the case of Nemertians, uh, or segmentation, as in the case of annelids? Is it logically impossible then for annelids and Nemertians to share a common ancestor with aplacophorans, who are actually secondarily worm-like mollusks? And is it logically impossible for them to share a common ancestor with platyhelminthes, nematoda, and nematomorpha, or xenocelomorpha? Both panarthropods and deuterostomes trace their ancestry back to wormy animals, and there is nothing inherently preventing different phyla of worms from being related to each other. Thus, by extending the same method that allows us to conclude a man is the father, or a person is of a particular ethnicity, or two species are more closely related to each other than to a third species, we can easily conclude that all animals share common ancestry. This is the argument Dr. Rana must make. He must be able to explain when a gene shared by two taxa is the result of common descent or independent design. For example, if we take the Hox gene, PAX6, which is involved in the regulation of eye development in all bilaterians, then Dr. Rana should be able to answer how many times this gene was independently created, unless he believes it is shared among all bilaterians as a result of common descent. And of course, we can extend this process further. Are all organisms that share the fusion of three genes involved in pyrimidine biosynthesis related? That includes all animals, fungi, amoebozoans, and various other protists. If I showed you a phylogeny of different protists, could you tell which are and aren't related? If so, how? Is anything related to anything in your model? Genetics tells us that all these organisms are related. Chlamydomonas, diatoms, euglena, foraminifera, and ichthyosporia are all related, though some only very distantly. Is chlamydomonas related to other green algae, land plants, or red algae? Are diatoms related to ciliates and dinoflagellates? The phylogeny challenge works at all levels of classification. It's a challenge to explain all the facts, not just the selected bits. So I ask again, is it impossible biologically for these protists to have descended from a common ancestor, evolving different morphologies under different selective pressures leading to the present diversity? Thank you. I yield the rest of my time. <clears throat> All right. That was at about eight minutes. So, so well, well under the time. So we'll, we'll just 
we will shoehorn that into the open discussion. And I will go ahead and pass it over to Fuzz here to give his intro. So I will just start on your first word and I will let you know when you're at 12 minutes. Okay, and let me go ahead and uh, share my screen, see if I can pull this off. There's just no, there's no elegant way to do this. It's always something with the screen sharing, that is for sure. All right, here we go. All right, so can you guys see that okay? Yes, it's struggling to go into the full screen mode, the oh. full slideshow mode. I think oh, he was doing the same thing with Jackson as well, where it didn't want to. Is that better now? Um, I don't see a change on my end yet. Okay. So, uh, all right, well. Okay, thanks. All right, well, first of all, um, I, I wanna say thanks to, to James for having me back on Modern Day Debate. And uh, it's a delight to see Erica again and always enjoy uh, our, the conversations I have with Jackson. Uh, and uh, there's been a few instances where we've been on the same side of the issue and a few instances on different sides of the issue. And so I'm going to uh, address the question, do all living things share a universal common uh, ancestry? And my answer to that question is going to be uh, not necessarily. So I'm not necessarily taking the affirmative or the negative, but uh, someplace in, the, in, in between, which I guess is part of Jackson's complaint. <laughs> so I'll address some of the questions that Jackson raised uh, during, the, um, during the conversation that we have, and I'm just going to lay out my perspective on this issue. And what I'd like to do is start with actually what has now become one of my favorite quotes to discuss and to interact with, and this is uh, from Theodosius Dobzhensky, who is the was the late um, a Russian geneticist of some renown and also interestingly enough, a Russian Orthodox Christian. And in, the in 1970, maybe I think was the year he wrote an article for the American biology teacher where he was appealing to educators to incorporate evolution more prominently into the, into the curriculum. And uh, as part of his appeal, he wrote these words, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And uh, these are now well-known uh, words. Uh, but the, the point that he was getting at is that today, uh, the, uh, the theory of evolution, for lack of a better way to describe it, is in effect the, the organizing principle in biology. It is the lens by which everything is viewed in biology, everything is interpreted. And, uh, and as, as part of that, uh, interpretive framework, of course, is this idea of universal common descent, as Jackson is pointing out, which is uh, in, in, effect, in effect the central feature of the evolutionary paradigm. And so this is, again, you know, the focus of our conversation today. And I want to just take a quick minute and make a clarifying point that I actually, and this is a subtle distinction, but I actually like to, to think of uh, biological evolution in, in distinct terms from what I will call the evolutionary paradigm, which is this grand overarching claim that everything in biology can be exclusively explained through evolutionary mechanisms. And this would include the origin and the design of life in its basic level, as well as uh, the history, diversity, and distribution of life. So this is the grand claim of the, of the evolutionary paradigm. So I would lump uh, the origin of life question into this, into this larger, um, into the larger paradigm, distinguishing it from, again, biological evolution. And this will become important, I think, in a, you realize why I'm making this distinction in a minute. And so, so you know, my position is uh, a, a view where I um, would argue for what I would say limited uh, universal uh, common ancestry, which again, is something that I think uh, and gathering drives Jackson nuts, but we'll, we'll unpack that. So how did I arrive at this particular position? Well, as an undergraduate student who was interested in going to grad school to, to get a PhD in biochemistry, I, of course, took courses in, in chemistry and biology. And in, <clears throat> at that time in my life, I readily embraced uh, the evolutionary paradigm, this idea that everything in biology could be explained through evolutionary mechanism, including the origin and, and the design of life. 
and uh, uh, you know, uh, would have held to this idea of universal common descent. So that earlier version of me and Jackson would have very little to disagree with one another about. In graduate school, my perspective changed uh, significantly because as a graduate student, I was immersing myself in the study of, of biochemical systems and became very impressed with the, the elegance and the sophistication, even you might argue the ingenuity of these systems. And I was really very curious as to how do we account for the origin of biochemical systems and hence the origin of life. And um, uh, I, uh, on the side, in addition to all the responsibilities I had as a graduate student, I began to study the origin of life question and, and quickly reached the conviction that mechanism alone didn't seem to be able to explain uh, the origin of, of biochemistry and the origin of life. And it was at this point I rec recognized that there were limitations to the evolutionary paradigm, to this grand overarching claim. And, uh, and so I realized that agency would be necessary, at least in my mind, to explain the origin of life. And this was uh, 35 years ago. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting to be really an old codger these days. And, uh, and, and yet I think the case for design and the challenge to the evolutionary explanation for the origin of life are more severe today. But at that time, I would have held, again, a view that uh, would have been very, uh, that, that Jackson and I would not have disagreed much about, where I would have held uh, to a view very similar to what Darwin uh, closes the origin of species with. That is, once the origin of life was in, uh, had, had occurred, that evolutionary processes would essentially explain the, the diversity of life from that point on. Uh, and uh, over time, um, I began to develop an interest in the philosophy of science and began to appreciate the role that philosophy actually plays in how we interpret the scientific record. And uh, one of the ideas that really uh, hit home was this idea that was um, implicit in everything I was learning as a scientist, but now made explicit through my reading in the philosophy of science. And that is the central importance of methodological naturalism to modern day science. And in a nutshell, this idea basically argues that every explanation that we bring to bear for the world of nature must require a mechanistic explanation uh, that we cannot appeal to agency in formulating explanations about the world around us. And, and I realized that this becomes a constraint on the operation of science that would have invalidated my conclusion as a graduate student that the origin of life required agency, not because the evidence wasn't there to, to support agency as an explanation for the origin of life, but because of this philosophical constraint. And this got me to think, are there other aspects of biology where methodological naturalism is influencing how we would interpret the record of nature? I also learned about something called the underdetermination problem. And, and this idea here is that uh, data underdetermines scientific theories, meaning that you can have two radically distinct theories that actually can accommodate the same set of data and that that same set of data can actually be solicited in support of two, again, two very radically different theories. And then last but not least is this idea of the concept of teleonomy. Uh, and this idea of teleonomy traces back to a philosopher of science in the 1950s and his name escapes me at the moment who argued that uh, in biology, of course, teleology since the Darwinian revolution was stripped from, from biology. And yet biologists struggle with the fact that they uh, are drawn to utilizing design language when they discuss and describe biological systems. And so as a way to resolve that, that discrepancy, he introduced the concept of teleonomy, which was in a nutshell would argue that the design that we see in biology is not bona fide design, but produced through mechanism. But yet that then frees us up to use design language without implying uh, teleological explanations in biology. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> so in, in light of all this, uh, I, I 
re recognize that you could actually interpret the, the biological realm from a design framework. And that the data that is oftentimes used to support uh, universal common ancestry in this case could also be understood from a design framework uh, where again, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of design. So then what about all the evidence for evolution? Uh, and the evidence for, for evolution and ultimately for universal common descent is really in two broad categories, homology and uh, the fossil record, the features of the fossil record. And this idea of homology, again, is, is really central to, I think, the points that, that Jackson was making as he was um, arguing for, again, you know, uh, common ancestry in, these, in the different groups that he was discussing. And it's interesting to me because today the idea of homology is, is uh, deeply entrenched within an evolutionary framework. It's intertwined with the evolutionary paradigm. And again, is the primary evidence I would suggest for, for common descent and universal common descent. But interestingly enough, when you look at the history of biology, prior to Darwin, biology was a teleological activity. It was a teleologically driven discipline and the idea of homology predates Darwin's theory. Uh, and uh, one of the scientists who was prominent in elaborating the concept of homology, Sir Richard Owen, uh, developed a, a theoretical framework to explain homology in which he evoked the use of archetypes where he argued that what you are looking at in, in homologies is a, an ideal or an archetype that, that for Owen existed in the mind of the first cause that then is functionally manifested in the created order uh, through a modification of that archetype to produce a wide range of different types of designs. And he elaborate, he, he, he defended this idea in a, in a series of lectures that he presented to the Royal uh, Society in London. Uh, and you can, uh, there's a, it's a fascinating book to read uh, on the vertebrate on the archetype of the vertebrate limb or something like that. But for Owen, the idea of homology was the quintessential evidence for design, interestingly enough, where he marveled at the fact that, <clears throat> that you could take the, uh, these archetypes and they would be so robust that they could be varied in such a way to produce a wide range of function. And so for Owen, that was the ultimate uh, expression of design. And here's a, a quote uh, from, uh, from Owen uh, that I'm not going to read just for the sake of time, where he's essentially making that point. And so, in other words, the, the evidence that um, <clears throat> is, is oftentimes considered to be unequivocal evidence for universal common ancestry could also be understood as uh, evidence for the, the shared design of organisms in nature. About 12 minutes, Fuzz. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll hurry it along here. And um, and so what, what Darwin did is he took Owen's idea of the archetype and he evolutionized it into, uh, into a, a common ancestor. Now, of course, this begs the question, well, why would a creator employ the same designs? You know, why not a creator in, in introducing a wide range of different designs within biology? So this is really a theological question more so than a scientific question. But as I thought about this, this interesting point, uh, if, if a creator created organisms with unique, a unique set of designs with each organism, then in, in effect, biology would be uh, impossible as a scientific discipline or it'd be very, very challenging. Uh, and the fact that, that there's these shared designs in biology actually makes biology really a, a robust scientific discipline where, for example, as a biochemist, what I learn about the biochemistry of E. coli has broad applicability across the entire living realm, which is mind boggling when you think about that. And so you could argue that, 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 that the shared designs actually reflect a deeper aspect of design, namely that nature is designed for discovery and intractability. What about the fossil record? Well, it's interesting when you go back into the history of biology prior to Darwin, people like Louis Agassiz argued that the fossil record in a sense reflects a series of progressive acts of creation. Uh, and you know, it's interesting to me that when we uh, look at uh, objects that are designed, we see uh, uh, progressive creations all around us and we are comfortable interpreting these as evidence for design. 
So for example, the, the automobile, uh, it's clear that when you look at the history of the, the design of automobiles, that we realize that there are, there's this prototypical design and that future designs are built upon prior designs and, uh, and, and the designs that are yet to be developed will be built upon current designs. And, and yet we don't feel necessary, or we don't feel the necessity of viewing this as, again, evidence for common ancestry or common descent, but rather we see this as reflecting shared designs that are, again, progressively introduced. Or if we look at mosaics in the fossil record, uh, we, we design mosaics all the time. Smartphones are the quintessential example of a mosaic design. I'm old enough now that I can remember when cell phones were a new thing. <laughs> and, and then you had digital cameras and then you know internet devices and, and the iPod and things like that. And all of this is essentially compressed into a single design uh, that represents a mosaic. And so why couldn't we interpret features in the fossil record that again, Jackson is alluding to uh, from the standpoint of mosaic designs. So in other words, and I'm just gonna stop there. In other words, uh, I think that it's possible to develop a, a framework in which you could interpret the, the same evidence for universal common ancestry from a design framework and, and make perfect sense of, of the record of nature. Uh, and so part of my project at Reasons to Believe isn't to uh, poke holes in the evolutionary paradigm, but rather to try to come to the table with an alternative design or a creation model that could actually, again, seek to accommodate the data that we see in front of us and, and make sense of it from a design framework. So I'll go ahead and stop there and we can uh, move on to the, the next part of the program. All right, cool, 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 cool. That was about 15, 16-ish minutes, so totally good. We'll just add, um, we'll add Jackson's spare time to the open discussion. And uh, whenever, whenever you guys feel like beginning, by all means, please do. I will um, let you know when we're about at about 50 minutes, uh, five zero, and um, and and we'll just get the ball rolling. So, <clears throat> I think. We can, so as I did in my discussion with uh, Smokey, I'm not convinced that abiogenesis is really part of this discussion because abiogenesis, the origin of, of biochemistry would have occurred significantly before the last universal common ancestor of all life. Would you, would you agree with that? Um, yeah, yes and no. I mean, I, in, in a sense, I'm not really looking at bringing abiogenesis into the conversation today. Okay. I just simply, it, telling as part of my, the, the, the journey I took to wind up where I'm at today. Okay, I got The you. idea of, of the fact that, that, that the origin of life to me looks like it requires agency uh, then opens up the possibility that maybe the rest of biology could be understood from a design framework. So gotcha. that was really, really okay. my point. Although uh, just, it, 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 we don't need to get into this too much, but, uh, but I would point out that when you are talking about universal common ancestry, you are going back to the, the you know, the last universal common ancestor, right? You know, whatever that is, right? right? Whether it's a single organism or a community of organisms. Right, right. And in, 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 a, in a sense, you could argue that the last universal common ancestor is essentially the end product of, of, of the origin of life process, right? Again, and so in a sense, the origin of life and you know the idea of universal common ancestry do form a, a continuum, right? Where sure. the line you would draw sure. is arbitrary, and what happens in the origin of life is imprinted on all life on Earth from an evolutionary perspective. Sure, so, sure. but 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 to to your point, I, I don't think that is a way that we would evaluate the question on the table. Right, right. Okay, I just wanted to right. I just wanted to get that out of it. Okay. Um, the thing about, and I do really want to go through some of the some of the the ones in the, in the PowerPoint. Um, uh, we don't have to go through all of them, of course, but maybe at least a couple of them, uh, because you, at, oh, you became very much more interesting when you started alluding to Richard Owen and, and Louis Agassiz. Do you hold to the position of of repeated creation events? Um, what do you mean by that exactly? Like the, because as far as I remember, like Owen was under the impression that like 
God made you know the Paleozoic critters, which at his time mostly like fish and shells, and then you had another creation event, which was the dinosaurs, and then they were wiped out, and then you have another creation event, which is the mammals, and that leads to today. Do you hold to that position? Yeah, bro- I would say broadly speaking, yeah. So I would say that that when okay. you look at the history history of life, that 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 at different eras in life's history, there were there were acts of creation, but I but I also allow for again limited limited you know common dis- limited common descent. In other words, I think what is it, you know created would be some kind of archetypical design that then would be mm-hmm. very would be could be varied through evolutionary mechanisms. So that would be broadly the, the interesting. That I would take. That is very interesting. Okay. All right. Um, so my, my question to that effect would be, so the, do you have, do you draw lines at the major eras or where would you say your, the creation events are occurring geologic wise? You, you know, that, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in a sense, in, in, this is probably going to frustrate you, Jackson, so I apologize. <laughs> but this is, st- this is, to me, still uh, very much, I would, to be quite frank, a, a work in progress. Where, okay. I mean, know, that's fair. It's a fair yeah, answer. Yeah, you know, where I'm still sorting that out myself. And, and what I'm trying to do is, is uh, you know, for example, again, I, I don't want to shape my, my apologetic at, at, at poking holes in the evolutionary paradigm. Sure. I'd rather come to the table with a, a model that could, you know, be evaluated and can make, uh, you know, a constructive sure. contribution. Sure. But but I do, you know, like with the origin of life, I do think there are key mm-hmm. transitions in life's history that at this point in time, I don't think evolutionary biology does a great job of explaining. I think, okay, for example, the origin of eukaryotic cells, and I know the the endosymbiont hypothesis is the, the one of the prevailing models. And it has some strengths with it. But when you start getting into a lot of the molecular details about what would have had to transpire, mm-hmm. boy, it really, it, it really seems like to me that there's some real issues there. Well, or, I, you know, I, in, or, or yeah. like, you know, the, the, you know, or like, I think the origin of body plans is still largely unexplained. Mm. You know, origin of consciousness, the origin of, uh, you know, um, human exceptionalism. So I think there's some places okay. in, in life's history where I don't think, it's not to say that there's not models that are being proposed. Sure. But to say, I don't think those models are, are compelling. So, okay. So, That's... but, but all to your question, sorry, I, I apologize. Oh, no, you're fine. No, I, I think, I, I, I feel I think like it's I'm dominating here and I don't mean to do that. So, so, but that factors into where do I draw the line? Right. So, so to me, I would think in terms of organismal biology, I would definitely say at the point of phyla, that would be probably where the creation event could be. Maybe you could talk about at classes, maybe at orders, mm. but I'm I'm not, I've I've not sorted that out. I, I'm so, perfectly comfortable with evolution at the family level and, and below. Okay, so oh, a lot of stuff, a lot of lot of lot of stuff. Lot. We could talk for hours and hours on this, which unfortunately we don't have. But um, so if okay, so for instance. If we're talking about, if you're saying that you accept all, um, you know, the body plan as your your metric, which is in modern taxonomy about the phylum level, but these are yeah. taxonomies largely arbitrary. I, I agree with that. Um, so by that, we would say that elephants and, you know, birds, for instance, have the same body. They have the same body plan overall right they have the the features of chordates you know the, the post anal right. tail notochord uh pharyngeal arches all that kind of stuff so so the robin the american robin and the african elephant share a common ancestor under your model yes yes yeah okay okay so i'm actually glad we picked this one because i did make a slide for that uh, <laughs> oh i need to share <laughs> again Okay, so can you can see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so that's that actually this very discussion about core dates, this is where the lines start to blur, in, in my opinion, my unprofessional opinion. Um, so we have here at the top, 
Anaspis, Jamoitius, and, and lampreys, right? And these are fish. They're, they're fish by our, by uh, what the researchers uh, would call it. They're all within, you know, the, uh, the vertebrates, okay? And so then you have, so they're all connected. They all have vertebrae, right? They all have, have fins, even if they're very small. Uh, but they're jawless fish. They're not nathostomes. They're not sharks or ray fin fish or, or coelacanths. They're jawless fish. So you would say that since all of them are within the chordata, they share a common ancestor, right? Lampreys, um, Jamoideus, and Anaspis. I, I would say that that would be, to me, an open question as to where does the, the where does the archetype play a role, and then where does you know where do you know evolutionary mechanisms play a role in terms of shaping the organism? Right. So 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 to me, it's 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 honestly an open question. So I very much appreciate the the, the thrust of your point, in in the maybe the frustration in terms of not getting a clearer answer, but but in, in a sense, it's it's an open question from my perspective. See, and that's that's what's kind of interesting about when you mentioned the archetypes thing, because um, Owen correctly predicted before we had fossils of it that the archetype of chordates would look like Pacaya. He did that way, way before, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, the guy who uh, Gould talks about in uh, Wonderful Life, well, way before he was, you know, oh, Simon around. Conley Morse. No, not Morris. Uh, the guy who discovered the Burgess Shale by accident. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Walcott. I can't remember his name. But anyway, so, uh, but you know, so long before he was fiddling around in in Canada, um, Owen predicted that this is what the archetype of of chordates would look like, and indeed he was right. It it does. It has these characteristics, right? All chordates have at some point in their life, even if they they lose it, like you know, tunicates are are highly reduced in their adult morphology. They swallow their brain like a, a professor with tenure um they you know they still have these characteristics and so i get my, my point kind of comes down to couldn't any of these really be the archetype of their later of their their descendants like metaspergina with its cranium could you you could say be the archetype of everything with a cranium zongzaniscus could be the archetype of everything with s-shaped myomeres and dorsal fins Pacaya could be the archetype of all chordates. Sacaglossus, though it's a living animal, so obviously it's not the direct ancestor, but our common ancestor with that, who had deuterostome development, was the archetype of everything with deuterostome development. Or we could go further, you know, all bilaterians. Or if we go to my other slide, uh, uh, where I made my point about all the organisms in this slide, fungi, animals, amoebozoans, have a, have a, a, a gene fusion for pyrimidine biosynthesis. It's three genes all fused together that, that participate in this activity. So we could say theoretically, the archetype of triple gene fusion pyrimidine biosynthesis was an amoeba, right? And then just evolutionary processes went from there and we have fungi and now we have animals, right? Theoretically, we could say that, couldn't we? Yeah, yeah, we could. And, you know, again, you know, I, I'm not, uh denying that, that, that there is evidence that, that one could bring to the table for universal common answer, ancestry, just like you're bringing that evidence to the table. But you know, let's use the, the automobile as, a, as an example uh, uh, that I think might help address the, the, the point you're, you're bringing from, from my perspective. So when you, when you look at an automobile, there's clearly a, an archetype for an automobile that all automobiles throughout the entire history of uh, throughout all automotive history all share. But as you go through the progression in, in terms of, you know, automobile, you know, development, in, that there are going to be points in time where there are these new innovations that are introduced that are then put on top of that, that existing archetype so that you really have kind of a combination of archetypes, if you will. And that combination of archetypes then in itself, in, eff in, in effect, becomes that archetype for everything that that follows it in terms of you know automotive development so in a sense you could look at you know the history of life that in in the point that you're bringing in in those terms where you could say yeah all these these features that you're successively pointing to that are are typical could could be innovations in and of themselves introduced by the work of a designer 
that are then used, that are then built upon in subsequent, you know, subsequent innovations. Sure, you could, but then we could flip that and go the totally opposite direction. We could say, well, every innovation of a new species is therefore an independent creation. Couldn't we? Because if, if, if one species, you know, develops, it's you know, a bird and the original population is brown, but, uh, you know, a, a subpopulation develops, uh, goes from brown to, to being black, right? right? Well, couldn't we say, well, that was an independent creation? Even if we know the the mechanisms that, that cause that, would we be justified in saying that? Um, you, you could, but uh, but here it would be an instance where you, you, you're bringing in uh, what we what we observe as well as mechanisms available to us to explain those observations. So, for example, you know we we observe um, you know what one might call microevolution. That, that, that to me is, is, has been observed. We observe speciation events. So it's, it, you know, this is, not, this is not disputed. We observe, you know, uh, microbial evolution, you know, all around us. So no, no complaint with that, but the mechanisms that we have, uh, you know, actually, uh, you know, with natural selection operating on, you know, genetic variation, can readily account for, for these kinds of transitions. And this is where I, I'm not convinced that the, the mechanisms available to us now, at least as, what, as we understand it, are sufficient to account for what I would call biological innovation. You know, uh, and, and so you know, the, 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 this is known as the novelty problem in evolutionary biology, where there, is, there is, are, are real questions uh, about whether or not you know, evolution, the evolutionary mechanisms that we have can, can account for novelty. And so at that point, that then enters into the conversation. Can these mechanisms we have available to us explain the, right. the, the introduction of, of new novelty that then form essentially that, that new you right. know, combined archetype, right? Right. Well, okay. But the, the thing about it is if, if we go back to the archetype example, then we're talking about like the, the ancestor of of elephants and robins was something like a lamprey or, or a lancelet to be more precise, right? So clearly, I, I, I think you would agree that there have been some novelties that have been generated between, you know, lancelets and African elephants, yeah? Right, and, so th and this gets to, to kind of Agassiz's view of, of the fossil record where it's a progression of, of creation events where- Well, I wouldn't really call it a progression, but- <clears throat> well progression in the sense that it's uh, going through the course of time. Or, or, well, we could even take it back a little bit. If we look at, if we look at the African elephant, which is you know, a modern animal, you would say that it's related to the early proboscideans uh, in like the Eocene, the early Cenozoic, right? Like most Marotherium. Likely. Yeah, okay. most likely. So the closest relative based on genetics that we have of African ele or of elephants in general is manatees, manatees and, and dugongs. And they nest within the clade with, with hyraxes and aardvarks and elephant shrews. Because of course, elephant shrews are related to elephants. I think that's hilarious. But, but right, so we have genetics and this says, okay, all these afrothairs nest with each other. I don't know if there's a defining morphological character among them, I didn't do research on it, but, but they all nest genetically with each other, right? So you would say they had a single common ancestor who gave rise through natural selection, sexual selection, to these these various species? Correct. Um, possibly. I mean that that that's a that's a possible interpretation that would be viable within my within the framework. Okay. Uh, but but it, but it's also possible that you're looking at, you know, uh, you know, instanta uh, instances of of you know, some kind of creation event as well. See, I, I find this interesting because. In other I'm, words, I, I'm not, I don't hold, I, you know, I, I, I don't hold tightly to any one particular interpretation, but I'm willing to let the data basically, you know, dictate where, where the answer to that question lies. So okay. again, I would reject the notion of universal, you know, common descent, but I'm right. open. And, to and that's way afield from what I'm talking about, like at the moment. 
Right. Okay. So just if we're talking about just like elephants and manatees and hyraxes and elephant shrews, would you be comfortable with saying they all share a, a natural common descent from a single ancestor? Would I be comfortable with it? Uh, I would. Yeah. Yeah. I would be comfortable with it. Uh, okay. it's, 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 it's a, it's a possibility. I would be very much open to that, but I would also be comfortable saying that maybe they don't. Right. And, and that's where I would, would want to, you know, I, I'm a biochemist, not an organismal biologist. And so I would need to, to roll up my sleeves and, and spend some time in, in the literature to really look and see at, you know, well, what, they would agree. What, what, the, what the detail is, you know, available there. And, and then the, and then assess it based on that. Right. Well, we have, have the genetic evidence is very is very much non equivocal in the question of elephants, manatees, hyraxes are all the closest relatives to each other, right? And they also share a biogeographic pattern, right? They're all all of them. Their ancestors come from Africa. The earliest Cyrenians are in like Egypt, I think the the Fayum area, and you have you know, the earliest hyraxes, which are from Africa. The earliest elephants. And so you have this biogeographic data, this fossil data, this genetic data, which is all concordant. And then you have, and so you have them kind of all together. And so each of these are different orders, right? Heracordia, Proboscidea, uh, Sirenia. These are all different orders. Although, of course, order doesn't really mean anything. Class doesn't really mean anything. There's no, there's nothing tangible. We can't touch a phylum, right? We can touch a species, although that's a different conversation right. that uh we're, we don't really have time to get into but um but these are just terms that we've invented for ease of classification right so when we're talking when we're going from elephants to manatees to hyraxes we're increasing clades but we're still talking we're still talking about the same thing it's just speciation events over time just this biogeographic pattern with these speciation events which are just occurring over and over and over and over right 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 and and you know and, and i'm i'm I would agree with your point, which is part of, I think, the, frust the frustration, even for me, in terms of the, the, the model that I'm embracing, is because, again, we species does sort of have some kind of biological sure. you know, aspect to its definition, the same right. with phyla. But once you're in between, you now are, again, in, in, in what, what, constitutes a family for one group of organisms doesn't necessarily Correct. constitute right. a family for another group of organisms. So it's really hard to, 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 to talk about this in general terms. It would be more in, ter in specific terms. Right. And that kind of gets, well, I mean, see, even talking about phyla, because again, I have a little thing for this, um, makes it difficult because you start getting into things like, like, clusters of clades like clusters of phyla that all nest really close together such that it's darn hard for the people who study this for a living to figure out which is sister to which mm -hmm. because either they have like in this case uh if you look here at um so trochophore so we have the the aplacophorans annelids and nemertians so these are all these three phyla are all very close together they're all like core eutrochozoa Right, so within spiralia, they have a characteristics like the trochophore and and a few other things, uh, developmental genes like LOX5 and things like that, which, which connect all of them. And so, again, it's like these are are different phyla, right? The body the body plan of of mollusks, if you can call it that, is basically they all have a dorsal visceral mass, and that's about it. Because even the the foot, the radula, is not shared among all mollusks so they they kind of really only have this one feature which is sort of similar and their ancestors in the fossil record are sort of wormy and you have these other very closely related groups which are also kind of wormy and so it seems like they're all sort of descended from a, a wormy ancestor who went in different directions either the, for the eversible proboscis for the nemertia segmentation for annelids or the radula or dorsal visceral mass for, for mollusks and so it seems to me that these are are not super crazy in terms of like their their biochemical structure or what have you. So it seems like it, it very much could have been a common ancestor of these three phyla who then through natural processes gave birth to each of these, these phyla. Would you be? Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is where, you know, um, you know, where I think, you know, um, uh, other other considerations would come into play. So sure. 
uh, you know, since we're dealing with the origin of phyla, and, and again, I'm not an organismal biologist, so, you know, um, you know, bear with me on this. But, you know, when it comes to like the, the origin of deuterostomes, at least my understanding uh, at one point in time back in the, in the day when, when I when I took zoology, good grief, uh, you know, the, <laughs> when you talk about the origin of deuterostomes, I mean, the, the traditional model has been that that the an, 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 that a kind of demata was the you know was the the the, 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 the phylum that kind of rooted um, deuterostomes and that out of a kind of demata came uh, the the chordates and the hemichordates as kind of two branches where in within um, the chordates you would have urochordates first and then cephalochordates and then after that the craniates right so that was kind of broadly speaking the the evolutionary model, sure. right? For for yet when you look at um, at the Cambrian in uh, you know record, and you look at uh, the Shenzhen biota in China, mm -hmm. it, it it looks as if all of these phyla are, are coexisting, and so you know so to me that then is another piece of evidence that you know I think argues against uh, you know common ancestry at least with regard. To those phyla because they are all co-occurring, inclu including, um, um, you know, the the uh, the uh, jawless fish that are you know were also discovered in that in that biota. So it seems to me like when you're looking at again the origin of deuterostomes, that's another piece of evidence that comes into play is that you don't see that clear ancestor an ancestor and descendant type of relationship among the phyla. But rather they co-occur. So that so, would be a piece of evidence that I would say then would I would incorporate as in to justify my interpretation that at least with the deuterostomes, these represent archetypes that were that were created. So I preempted that response and uh, last night I made a couple of slides talking about different Precambrian biota that have been assigned to various phyla or or sets of phyla. Uh, which appear before their ancestors, before their the relatives in the in the Cambrian. Um, but also, I do want to point out before I get before I jump into that, we get too deep in the fossil thing. Uh, I really don't have a problem with these clades up being alongside each other. I suspect in the case of chordates and their their deuterostome relatives, which are all very close to each other, um, that, or that that they are living alongside, that they probably occurred originated pretty close in time which is also probably why there has been such a debate among researchers over wh which branches first, cephalochordates or urochordates. Uh, are hemichordates sister to echinoderms or are they a separate group? Or actually in a recent paper, and I don't agree with it per se, but I'm just using this as kind of an example. They argue that uh, echinoderms may actually branch before, uh, or may branch like separately from the rest of the deuterostomes, which are Xenoturbella, which is one of the Xenocelomorphs, also flipped from being a relative of Echinoderms to being a, a Xenocelomorpha. They're all kind of, I agree with you, they're very close around there, but that that's because they branched similarly in time, not necessarily because they were separate creation events. I would think if they were separate creation events, they would be radically different in some respect or another, not, okay, here we have a bunch of, species some of which are kind of similar to each other but some kind of not and they all have a lot of these features well and, and this is where the, the the point that i made uh, about why would there be these these shared designs that we see right in biology why I, I, I took the time to make that point uh because you know think about you know it it's interesting to me that you know when you you look at the the interpretation of the, of the cambrian fossil record which i think is just one of the most uh in, in one of the most remarkable scientific accomplishments. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. it, it, and, and, you know, who is the guys, Whittington and uh, Derek Briggs and Simon Collins. Oh, yeah, that, absolutely. That, that, that group that, that really did Zaravlev it. and Wood and all those guys, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and you know, what, what an incredible uh, scientific accomplishment, but they were, in, a, in effect, able to, to interpret the Cambrian fossil record because of the shared designs that we see you know, that, that in other words, that organisms that are alive today then now form um, 
you know, form a, a, an interpretive framework that allows you then to go that far back in time and make sense of some really unbelievably fascinating and bizarre, you know, creatures well, sure. that are just amazing to contemplate. Right. So, so to me, you know, when you talk, you talk about, well, well, from a creation event, why would there be these kind of features? I, j I see that as, again, uh, part of the creating a world that's designed for discovery so that there's, you know, that the, the shared features are not only reflecting an archetype, but reflecting essentially uh, a means by which, you know, the, the biological realm is intelligible. So, you know, so I think that from my, from my model perspective, when you ask that question, that's how I would engage it or address it. Okay. Well, and so see, that's what's kind of interesting about it because it's within the Cambrian, you have a number of organisms, and even within the late pre-Cambrian, the Ediacaran, you have organisms which at this point, if, if we're talking about a design model, we're saying God basically made a set of transitional forms, then another set of transitional forms, and then decided to make the crown groups. Because that's what we're looking at with here. Because if you look here, we have so uh, uh, Namakalathus, Camborella, Claudina, Yolingia. So Yolingia, which I mentioned earlier in, in my, my opening, is, uh, is an early panarthropod. It has these lobes on each of its segments, which are its trilobe, just like trilobites, which are crown arthropods, right? Um, Namakalathus is lophophorate. Now it's only listed, at, now these two are large, are, cl are clusters of phyla. Panarthropoda is arthropods, tardigrades, and onychophorans, the velvet worms, right? So here you have an ancestor who seems to be sort of at the base of all of those. Doesn't have legs, but it has these features which are, but it has these, these, these uh, segments where each segment bears these little features, which is reminiscent of later true arthropods, which of course didn't appear until the Cambrian. And for Namakalathus, uh, it's a, a lophophorate. It's a, it's a primitive lophophorate. The lophophorates are brachiopods, uh, for, foranids, uh, and bryozoans, right? And so this guy has the features uh, which have led researchers to classify it as sort of at the base of that clade. Same for Kimberella. Um, some researchers class it as a mollusk. Some say it's more basal than that, um, that it's in fact kind of at the base of Eutrochozoa because it sort of has this little shell and it has a sort of radula-like foot, right? But it's not a true mollusk. It, it's not quite like any of the later um, mollusks who appear in, in the camp in the Cambrian. Uh, Claudina is an annelid, uh, possibly a polycate. Uh, I'd just say it's an annelid. I'm not quite convinced it's a polycate per se, but but here we have these, and I also did another slide on it. But so we have, or again, you know, with Dickinsonia and Icaria, we have stem bilaterians who are at the very end of the Precambrian. So it's like it's. And then, you know, earlier than these guys, we just have like uh, Hautia, which is an Idarian in, in the Ediacaran. Eosathospongia may be a sponge. The jury's kind of out. Some say it is, some say it isn't. So that's why I put a question mark. Um, and then earlier than these, we just have like uh, some protists and we have some algae and some fungi. And that's really about it. And so it looks like if, if, we're, talking, if we're talking about these in stages, then I kind of have to ask, Again, like I asked earlier, where do we draw the line in terms of the biota that God is making and then letting it run for a little while and then he's creating a new set of biota, letting it run for a little while because is, is Dickinsonia part of the same biota that the Cambrian is? Because, fun fact, the, uh, some of these, some of the, the pre-Cambrian, the Ediacaran fossils extend into the Cambrian. There's a continuity between certain things like Claudinids and like... Uh, the, the Icaria, there's a continuity here. So they sort of overlap with some of their you know, descendants and then the descendants take over, the earlier guys die out and the descendants you know, go off and diversify. And so it doesn't seem like there's any design event happening there at that boundary. It seems like you have stem bilaterians and you have this continuity, you have some crown bilaterians like, like here, and then you have the, the, the crown members of these phyla uh, once you get into the Cambrian, like Pacaya, and as you mentioned, the Chengjing biota, you know, things like that. So, so your, your, um, your point, if I'm understanding correctly, is that there's not, um, there's no break per se. There's no break that you would expect right. if there are these design events, that there would be these very clear 
distinct breaks. Sure. Yeah. That's so. That's your point. Yeah. Yeah. That. That. I mean, that's a, that's an interesting point, and you know, uh, I I would have to think about you know that that point a little bit in terms of you know why would it necessarily look like that? You know, you you want to be careful about adopting the mode that anything that you can't necessarily explain just as simply the way God chose to do it. I would like to sure. say that there's there's a rationale that would undergird why things would appear that way. And so that would be a place where, you know, I, I would have to give some thought to to it as to why okay. there's not that. I mean, that's a fair there. answer. That's right? a fair it, answer. But on the other hand, I don't, I don't know that they would necessarily have to, I mean, that anything would necessarily demand that there would be these nice, clean, clear cut breaks necessarily. Well, okay. I mean, that's, I, I can grant you that, but at the same time, I would, I would be kind of confused because then I would still have to say, well, which is designed and which isn't. If we go to the, the Cambrian and we're like, okay, we have Kimberella, who's an early mollusk relative. And then we go, you know, we kind of bounce over the line to the, the Cambrian. We say, okay, well, here we have Wawaxia and Halkiaria. Are these part of the same design? Are they descendants of Kimberella or are they a separate design event? How could we tell the difference? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's a fair, that's a fair point. And I think this is where, again, I think there's other data that needs to be factored in. And that sure. would be, you know, part of, part of the challenge here is that we don't have a really good understanding of how the genotype of an organism relates to the, the phenotype, right? I mean, that's the, that's the, those are, that's the $64 million right. question in biology today, right? And that is right. of course related to the issue of how do you explain and account for the origin of body plans? It's all kind of tied up. And without really having that that understanding, I think it's very challenging to to address you know um, you know to address some of the specific questions that you're bringing to the table, and they're they're fair questions, right? But without that understanding, I think it's it's it, it represents a, a challenge, I think, uh, to you know to the to a creation model. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not. But I'm not completely convinced that the evolutionary models got it buttoned down, right? I think it's just as much an outstanding question from that standpoint as well. Well, the the genotype phenotype thing, sure. Um, but well, yes and no to the the question of body plans, because from the literature that I've seen, when you look at papers on, say, the, the phylogenomics of some some phylum, what we see a lot of is acceptation. We see a lot of building on pre-existing things. I was actually just the other day looking at the, the paper on the, the genome was sequenced for Lingula, which is one of the, the, the living fossil brachiopods. Uh, it was, it was, this pa paper was done back in 2015. Well, one of the things they were talking about was the shell of Lingula is not necessarily uh, derived from a shelled ancestor with, um, with mollusks but they used a similar pathway, which a similar biochemical pathway to build shells. So they sort of co-opted the same pathway to build different types of shells. Mollusks have calcium carbonate shells and um, brachiopods have calcium phosphate shells. So they're co-opting the same thing, the same pre-existing thing, but for different purposes. Um, same with, uh, if you look at like, um, uh, what is it? The, the, the mycorrhizae of fungi. Right, they didn't have to invent a whole new genetic system for their little mushroom roots. Right, they they were building on pre-existing genetic structures that were already there. Same for uh, uh, papers on on the the origin of animals. The Ermetozoan are always talking about lots of duplication events occurred after our common ancestor with coanoflagellates. So between coanoflagellates and our common ancestor with sponges, we have a whole bunch of gene duplication events. The expansion of a lot of gene families. And that's kind of what we see all throughout animals. It's, it's not a whole lot, th though there is some, uh, obviously there's, there are some, you know, a de novo gene pops up here and there for whatever reason. But the majority of it is, here's this gene that already existed, or here's the structure already existed. We're just going to use it for a new thing now. Because, you know, natural selection favored it doing this thing now rather than what it was originally doing. Right? And, and so coming back to sort of the body plan, thing do you find that significant um yeah and and, and um you know th this again goes back to the the some of the points i was making in my opening presentation and that is 
you can interpret the same data, I think, within a creation from a creation model framework uh, uh, as you can from a, an evolutionary framework. So, uh, what you're you know you're talking about, you know, would be genetic and, and examples of genetic and biochemical archetypes that could right. then be you know varied to produce different types of functionality you know, within systems. Right. And so the, the, the real question then becomes, uh, you know, you, you, so the, the way you're interpreting it as a course from an evolutionary perspective is through a process of, you know, exaptation, you mm. know, um, and, uh, and, and, and you're cobbling together new, you know, new, you know, you know, new physiological systems right. or whatever, sure. right? Uh, whereas I would just say this, this could be understood as again, uh, you know, a creator utilizing the same archetypical well, in various yes. different ways. But that's my question is, which one was the archetype? Was the archetype the archetype of brachiopods or the archetype of brachiopods plus mollusks or the archetype of brachiopods plus mollusks plus crabs? Which one was the archetype and how exactly do we pinpoint that archetype? Where did they live historically in time and, and how can we know that? Yeah, and 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 again, you know, not to to repeat myself, but okay. I'm going to. But but again, it would be again going back to the automobile example where you could have archetypes that are then stacked upon each other, you know, where there are different archetypical features introduced at different times, uh, and when that happens, you're in effect creating a a new archetype that's a combination of pre-existing archetypes, you know. Plus, you know, new art, a new archetypical features that are tacked on. Then couldn't it. everything be a new archetype then, just stacked on top of an old archetype? In that case, couldn't we go all the way back to like the eukaryotic common ancestor and say that's the archetype? Everything else onward, ferns to humans, are stacked on top of that archetype, but not by a creation event, but by evolution, natural selection. Yeah, and and this is where you know. The, I, the, the point I'm, I'm making is not so much to argue against uh, universal common ancestry or argue for kind of an archetypical interpretation of life's history, but is to, to make the point that I think both interpretations are equally valid. What distinguishes the two in, interpretive systems is in effect philosophical consideration. So we're, what we're bumping into Right now, Jackson is the, the consequence of the underdetermination problem, right? Is that it's the same set of data could be interpreted in two very different uh, frameworks, you know. And where we, what you would probably have to do is come up with some kind of series of tests that would say one that would give favor to one framework over the other as a way to, to kind of break the tie. Yes, yes, I would like, agree with that. I, I would definitely agree with that. And so I would say evolution has already done that. I would say my, and I would say that would, that can be done in say predicting transitional fossils, something like Tiktaalik or Microraptor or Diarthrognathan. Things did in fact share a common answer or well, let me phrase that. If this group is descended from this group, we should expect something with a blend, a mosaic of both characters. Not necessarily all the extreme characteristics diagnostic of both, but somewhere you know, sort of in the middle. Like uh, the Tiktaalik has some of the features of the earlier lobe fin fish, but also some of the features of tetrapods. Same for Microraptor has some of the features of birds, but also some of the features of non-avian dinosaurs. And Diarthrognathus is like a beautiful little synapsid transition. And so that's where I would say we can do that, right? Maybe not for something as if we go back far enough, our ancestors like worms and protists, and it becomes sufficiently difficult to make fossil predictions about that. But but I would also say my 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 point to you would be to sort of figure out like where because there's the continuity as we talked about earlier. Where's where's the design event? And I guess I guess to you that that would be my my just my main point. I don't know. Maybe yeah. maybe it's a project for future work then, huh? Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, you know, I mean, the approach that we t we take at Reasons to Believe, and you, you, I don't know that this comes through if you would read some of my individual blog articles, but it, it's much more evident, I think, if you take a look at some of the books that I've written, 
but our approach is is in effect to develop what we would call you know a creation model where we are in a sense saying this is you know our framework for understanding you know in this case uh, biology and then you know we develop a set of predictions that can be then used to evaluate the model and so right in the book origins of life we lay out a model in in who was adam we lay out a model you know and then we then look at what the data says and we right. revise accordingly right and uh and, and so that's that's essentially you know the, the project that we're undertaking mm. and 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 so there's there's this frankly features of our creation model we've yet to actually probe in well, some sure. significant detail so sure. probably one of the, the next projects i'll tackle uh would be you know um essentially trying to produce a, a genomics model. So mm -hmm. how can we make sense of the, the, the features that we see in, in the genomes of organisms from a creation model perspective? Right. So in other words, we're, we're assuming uh, the burden of proof as opposed to forcing the burden of proof on the evolutionary paradigm, acknowledging that, you know, that again, the evolutionary paradigm, you know, is, uh, you know, is the mainstream thinking it's 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 evidenced right but I, but I also think that because of the influence of methodological naturalism there are places where uh real issues with evolutionary explanations are given a free pass um you know i mean and and, and i i'm most familiar with you know what happens in original life research and i don't i know we're not going to go there other i'm just going to use this as an illustration mm. You know um, where there are these problems that that arise that are really intractable problems if if people are are honest with it, and original life researchers are very quick to acknowledge this, the severity and the significance of these problems. Sure. And yet there's this idea that you know um, it's just a harder problem than we thought. You know we are we are going to still continue to pursue evolutionary explanations for this. Uh, uh, in the midst of that problem, which is which, which is perfectly reasonable response, but when there's also at the same time evidence that suggests the work of agency, that's simply just shut down. That's simply ignored. Uh, you know, there's a famous statement made by Paul Davies in his book *The Fifth Miracle*, where he said, "Hey, you would be forgiven if you would interpret or if you would conclude that the origin of life is a miracle, but we're not going to go there. That that science is all about." discovering natural process explanations. And so what happens is there's a pass that's being granted uh, in light of that real intractable problem that's then I think masked by the, by the influence of methodological naturalism that prevents other counter models from coming in and, and suggesting an explanation, right? And so, you know, I'm not saying that there's not evidence for, com you know, common descent or universal common descent and you, and you did a good job of, of laying out, you know, some of that evidence. But I'm also, I also think there are some places where there are some real, in my mind, real questions confronting the evolutionary paradigm that um, are significant questions that maybe will be resolved with future work, or maybe they won't be. Uh, but 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 that, that those are places where I would see cracks in the paradigm that at least should allow for an alternative explanation to come if that ex explanation is evoking agency. Well, we, we've answered to everything I've written down about your opening, so. <laughs> so awesome. let me ask you this question in, in this, you know, I, I'm asking it sincerely now, uh, you know, and t trust me because I said I'm asking it sincerely. Right? <laughs> uh, no, you know, so do you see cracks though in, you know, in, in, in the evolutionary paradigm, or do you, do you just see them as unanswered questions? So, for example, one of the things that that I think is a little disconcerting to me would be the the fact that you see incongruities in in different phylogenetic trees. You know, because um, and 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 you know, uh, I remember sitting at at um, at, the, at at the dinner table with Francis Crick. Sorry, not Craig, Francis Collins. Sorry, my <laughs> no, was at the dinner table with Francis. <laughs> oh, oh, I wish I was, but no. And Francis Collins, he's a pretty cool guy. 
oh yeah no yeah. enormous amount of respect for him and he and i were having this very discussion about incongruities and in, in phylogenies and you know where depending on the genetic marker that you look at you can get really very different evolutionary trees and his point to me was that once we start moving into phylogenomics this mm -hmm. all these problems are going to evaporate well i've got you know papers you know somewhere in my office where people have, are beginning to do phylogenomic studies and they're still seeing you know these incongruities in, in phylogeny so i see that for example as something that that i think should be troubling uh to uh you know to like a universal um you know universal common descent interpretation so i wouldn't really find uh well most of the i would say the vast majority of of issues that have been touched by phylogenetic or that have been touched by phylogenomics and genomics generally have we have come quite a ways from you know where we were prior to uh prior to genomics right you know the the purely morphological studies were all over the place and then once genetic sequencing kind of came into the picture things started to get resolved to a degree though not great and now with genomics things are really starting to come into ever clearer focus and and so there are discrepancies between some absolutely you know but um do i say that's a problem for evolution not really um and i would also say remember some of these lineages are stretching back 500 million years and some of them have uh, a very rel relatively recent speciation events from each other um things like uh like so with the mollusks and annelids and the mertians well who's sister to who exactly well because in time you know maybe within just a few million years they all sort of had us went their separate ways their separate lineage ways so what i said it's really a problem not really i guess it kind of depends you know you have things that would uh that um uh, make reading phylogenies more difficult or can like uh you know incomplete lineage sorting and you can have horizontal gene transfer and all those sorts of things but would i say that's a problem for evolution on the whole not really as you you know uh yeah questions sure problems mm, not really we might have time for another one or two quick issues before we jump into the Q&A. Thanks, guys. Yeah, Ketchup, well, mustard on hot dogs. <laughs> and we're at about 50 minutes, just like you guys are just nailing it on the timing today. So, you know, by all means, I, I could be here for as long as need be. So it's completely up to you guys. Okay. Well, um, you know, one other, one other issue, and I'd be curious to see your reaction to this, would be, uh, I think the, the widespread occurrence of convergence, that to me is perhaps the one issue that I find really uh, troubling from an evolutionary perspective. And, and I go back to the, to the, the work of, of Stephen Jay Gould in his, in his book, Wonderful Life, where he talks about you know, the historical, historical contingence, sorry, the historically contingent nature yeah. of, of evolutionary processes, where he makes a big issue about the idea that if you rewind the tape of life and replay it, that the outcome ought to be, you know, different every time. And, and yet, in, in light of that, you wouldn't expect there to be the, 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 the extent and the degree of convergence that you actually see, you know, within, um, within nature. And so, mm -hmm. to me, I, I see that as that is, is, is deeply problematic. And, and some of the examples of convergence that have been discovered are, you know, absolutely mind-boggling. In, you know, um, so you know, um, so anyway, th that would be another place where I would see, I would have some real concerns. You know, where you know here we're talking about kind of a companion concept to universal common ancestry. Well, I again, I really don't see that as a problem when different organisms inhabit the same or similar environments they have similar selective pressures which under certain contingent mutations can lead to having superficially similar features i don't really see a problem with that uh you ha do have to remember the time in which gould was writing uh, wonderful life was published in 1987 the view that gould had of the cambrian and of the preceding precambrian was radically different from the view that we have now right yeah. it, he takes an almost mystical tone with the cambrian which is i discussed just the other day with walker i i find that problematic 
because he refers to it as nature swapping out different arthropod parts and chordate parts and things like that. And I was kind of like, yikes, that's not a great way to describe it, in my opinion. It's a wonderful book, right? The great the book is great overall, and I do agree with his point on contingency. Um, there were a few other things I took issue with. Um, it turns out, well, I mentioned uh, Opa Binia and Anomalocaris in my, my intro. He was of the impression that these were separately derived from probably wormy ancestors, right? When in fact they weren't. They share a common ancestor who had compound eyes and a chitinous exoskeleton, and then they then later Anomalocaris developed jointed appendages. But yeah, I, I mean, I really don't find it. Uh, I don't find it troubling or anything like that. Um, that kind of leads to an interesting debate on, or which did occur between Conway Morris and Gould mm -hmm. on the nature of contingency. And I definitely fall in the Gould camp rather than the Conway Morris camp. Um, uh, things like, you know, the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. Rewind the tape of light, you know, would that strike again? Nah, probably not. Would, you know, the, would the Burgess decimation leave Pacaya? but not Anomalocaris. Um, eh. Well, that's why he called it a decimation. It seemed highly random. Why did Pacaya survive this little wormy guy, but not the big predator Anomalocaris, right? And so I think that's, that is actually quite an interesting discussion to have um, about, about the nature of contingency, the nature of, of organismal body plans, things like that. But, a pro but again, a question, sure. A problem, not really. Yeah, well, you know, um, I mean, when it comes to this idea of convergence, there's really, or sorry, not convergence, but historical contingency, there's really two facets to historical contingency. One is what are what are the events happening in Earth's history that are shaping right. you know, the, the history of life? Right. And the other would be the, the, the process itself. You know, so what what's happening internally in the organism that is essentially setting up its evolutionary trajectory right. and that those events too you know have a, a historical contingency to them oh it's well. a fascinating discussion and you know, i i enjoy it but you know i, I don't really consider it a problem for evolution yeah, well and, and, and this is where i i see it i do see it as a as a significant issue and you know so for example you know uh one of the, the most remarkable examples of convergence is the visual system of the sand lance and the chameleon where they both have these eyes that are that are, that move independently, and and they use the sure. the cornea to focus, not the lens. And there's they have identical musculature, and uh, the, the attack trajectory uh, for the fish and, and the the tongue extending from the chameleon are the same, and things like mm -hmm. that. And 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 yet, you know, they live in very different types of environments. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to argue that that the same selective forces were at play. And so that, yeah. that would just be one example, you know. Well, I'll give you another. Um, I, to, uh, uh, along those same lines, like the intelligence and the uh, visual acuity of, of cephalopods uh, compared to, to humans, right? You know, cephalopods are, are intellig you know, intelligent by our standards of, of like mollusks and things. Uh, but you're right, that was, it was very different selective pressures which led to that. They, their uh, visual acuity, their chromatophores, their intelligence all seem to relate to being at the bottom of the food chain for most predatory fish. And so you have to have a lot of adaptations to avoid being eaten. And so you're right, it's two different routes. In our case, it's having, um, we have a you know, long social uh, history with other members of our group. And, and in their case, it's, they're not social at all, but they're preyed upon, which is why it results in this. Not so much a problem, we have a, Darwinian mechanism, which accounts for for this in a sense, and so again, I don't really find that to be a problem. Yeah, well, you know, the the, the debate between um, Conway Morse and, and Gould was an interesting debate. Where, oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, where uh, Conway Morse, and I'm just beginning to really appreciate Conway Morse's argument, where he was in effect arguing that there seems to be something, you know, built into the laws of nature that seem to drive evolution to the same endpoints over and over again. So it, I guess, you know, the, it would be an idea that would be related to a, a school of thought called structuralism. Yeah, I'm familiar that's, with that's, it. that's arguing it's not natural selection that's shaping the history of life, but it's essentially the laws of, of 
the physics that are constraining certain right. outcomes, you know, and, uh, but, but, you know, for, for Conway Morris, who's a theist, uh, if I'm reading him correctly, he seems to see, um, he seems to see some pretty profound theistic implications, you know, you know, that is kind of like a, a, a biological anthropic principle. So he sees mm. some pretty significant theistic implications or teleological implications in, 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 in that view of, of evolution compared to, you know, historical contingency. Right. You know, yeah, I, I well, I, I think it's interesting, but at the same time, you can pick loads and loads and loads of convergent features. And the well, part of the problem with convergence is, I think there's a bit of 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 um, superficialness to it, sort of necessarily, because it's not the same structure, right? It's a different structure for a different purpose, and so we kind of have to ask ourselves: At what point do we stop considering something convergent, right? Well, like, you know, it is the triceratops and the buffalo are they convergent they both have horns they're both uh you know they both graze and all this but are they really convergent well that depends on how you use the term well but okay so you also you see uh for example uh convergence of echolocation in cetaceans yes. and cetaceans right. and uh, in chiroptera mm -hmm. and and it turns out that the 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 genetic changes that are supporting both forms of echolocation are virtually identical changes. And so that would be an example where you're seeing uh, convergence of two um, highly similar systems that also have the same kind of genetic undergirding. So it's not just simply a superficial uh, instance of convergence, but it's, it's, it's kind of fundamental to the right. design. So Right, sure, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I like the example of, um, of like sloths, or not sloths, um, uh, uh, porcupine, like arboreal porcupines and, and platyrine monkeys. Like they both have, you know, prehensile tails, which they evolve through separate evolutionary roots. But squirrels are also hugely prolific arboreal mammals, but they don't have prehensile tails. So clearly both of these work right? They're all living in the same sort of environment. They're, it's arboreal, although, you know, the potterines and, and the, the arboreal porcupines are in the tropics, right? And so it's sort of similar. Or they're living in the same environment, but they're coming to different, uh, they're living in these environments in different ways. You know, squirrels are, they're, they're little grasping claws, and they're very good at running up trees and stuff, but they're not using their tail to grab tree branches. So clearly, they're still very prolific, but they're not doing it the same way. Right, and so, and stuff like that is is kind of why, I, like, well, yeah, convergence happens, obviously, but to to what extent do we call something convergent? There are lots and lots and lots of examples of things that aren't convergent, and eh, it kind of depends. And that's why I say it's an interesting debate. It very it very much is. At what you know, what point is is something convergent? What point isn't it? And all that sort of stuff. I, I find that a very fascinating discussion. That could be like a, a separate debate all on its own, you know? Yeah. Guys, we are at about one hour. So Q &A. how do you feel about a Q&A? Let's sure. do. All right. Okay, I think James was going to go ahead and read our super chats because most of the super chats today are just very sweet and complimentary and not, and then I'm going to tackle the general questions afterwards. So take it away, James. My pleasure. And also, He's Eric, I, I did a quick- James, can you hear us? Hmm. James, have we Thank lost Thank you for it? your patience. All in. So I did a quick update on Twitter. I sent you a screenshot. So what we can do is I'll read the first super chat and then if you want to read the second super chat, we will we'll, we'll work through them together alternating back and forth and then we'll jump into those other questions. I just want to start with Ansi Sorvisto, thank you for your question said, "Happy holidays from Finland to everyone and have nice Yule or whatever you're celebrating you find people no questions just wanted to support well thanks so much we do appreciate that support sweet so for four dollars and fifty cents approximately of australian dollars we have from ian chen best platform best mod love jackson so there you go jackson ian is uh coming at you with feel a, my ego yeah a compliment knuckle sandwich so 
Nice. Ian Chen, lighten it up, says MDD chats are always just as fun as the debates. Glad you enjoy them, Ian. <laughs> and then <laughs> Ian Chen again for three Australian dollars. Question, why is Jackson and Erica so awesome? Thank you, Ian. That's very sweet of you. One of life's greatest mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And Ian Chen, thanks for your other question. Oh, wait, did you... I think you just read that. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. No, I got you on that one. Flat Earth Preacher, one of our local trolls. Glad to see you again, Flat Earth Preacher. Says, uh, no debate today here, but have a great day, all. Only looking for those Flat Earth debates, I guess. I was just thinking about it. It's like all, out of all the things that people take, you know, a big issue with today, and <laughs> someone uses the flat earth but you know what you're welcome no matter what your issue is we hope you feel welcome folks i i'm just glad that flat earth preacher donated money despite the fact that james runs the channel and you know from what i know is definitively a globe head like that's I, true. I think you are a globe head if memory serves which you know yep. that's that, that wouldn't run in line with flat earth preachers uh i am a globey it's true <laughs> Ian Chen for three Australian dollars again. Ian is just like really rolling out the cash for for MDB today. It says uh, Happy Festivus to James, Rana, Jackson, and Erica. So thank you very much, Ian. Um, I guess Ian is made of money, which is very must cool. be nice. Yeah, mu <laughs> yeah, must be nice. <laughs> thank you, Ian, and thank you so much for your question. Jumping into the standard questions as well. Oh, we, we did have a new one come in from Jeremy Wilson. Thanks for your super chat, Jeremy. Appreciate it. Said, in recent times, people seem to prefer to shut each other down rather than discuss differences. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Yule, etc. Thanks for all you do. Well, Jeremy, we appreciate you, and we couldn't agree more about the value of engaging with people from all walks of life. So thanks so much, Jeremy Wilson. That means a lot. All right. So for our standard questions, this one is from Nestling 20 and it's to Fuzz. A good theory makes falsifiable predictions that can be tested and do not depend on attacking alternatives. Can you provide any predictions for your theory on its own merit? Okay, yeah, um, it'd probably be easier for me to do that um, uh, with respect to, let's say, the question of human origins, because I've, you know, written a book called Who Is Adam, where we kind of lay out a creation model for the origin of humanity. Uh, and, and there, for example, the, the prediction would be uh, that, that human beings are exceptional compared to other creatures. That would be one prediction we would make. Uh, we would, you know, one prediction would, that would be uh, also made is that you could trace humanity's genesis back to a, a primordial pair. So those would be examples of the types of predictions you could make, you know, using a creation model. Uh, I, I'm currently, and, and this is kind of a, a back burner project right now, working on, as I mentioned, a, uh, a probably a book project on um, a, a creation model for genomics. And there we would make some very specific predictions about the nature of the structure of genomes uh, that, you know, could in pr principle be falsifiable. You know, uh, but you can't escape the, the implications of the philosophy of science. And, you know, uh, it's, the, the, you know, part of that question too is implying that falsification is the, the gold standard for a scientific theory. And I think uh, making testable predictions would be, uh, but it's very difficult, frankly, to falsify uh, predictions. Or um, it's it's a really difficult thing to do. Uh, so it, many times, what scientists actually are doing is uh, making observations and then pointing to the, ob the those observations as confirming the theory or forcing a theory to be revised if that that observation can't be accommodated by the theory. So. Um, but, but nevertheless, I appreciate the point and, you know, uh, it is possible to make falsifiable predictions. Um, I'm not given a lot of thought to it in this, in the, in the context of the question we're discussing today. You got it. Thank you very much, Dr. Rana and kicking it over to rational mind. Appreciate your question. It is for Dr. Rana. They said, Fuzz, what creation events today Oh, sorry about that. What creation events 
does he think, does Fuzz think, occurred between the origin of body plans and the origin of consciousness, as well as tetrapods, mammals, etc.? Um, you know, again, I'm going to frustrate you with that very fair and, and, and important question. And I, I still am sorting this out myself. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, I mean, the points that, that Jackson are making are good points, to be fair. And that is, you know, how do you distinguish between something that's clearly a creation event versus something that reflects the, the, the outworkings of, a, of an evolutionary process? And so that's something I just uh, have not given a, a appropriate thought to. Um, but to be fair, there's a lot of things that I, I have given <laughs> the thought to, primarily dealing with the origin of life and, and with the, the nature of biochemical systems. That's been over the last uh, 25 years, my primary focus of, focus of interest. Uh, Thank so, you, absolutely. Sorry, Jackson, but this is another one for Fuzz. You're hey, just getting. That's okay. You're you're getting um. You're it's it's a blowout for for the <laughs> for the specific questions. Uh, this one comes from R. G. Downard, and uh, for Fuzz, R. G. says, just as cars have different designers, on what scientific grounds can you limit the alleged designers to other or, uh, to other than many ones? I think what he's asking is essentially um, how how can you we look at multiple cars and we know that there are other you know multiple different designers for different car types how can you limit um, if you're supposing a designer for for life how can you limit it to a single designer rather than many? Yeah, and that was uh, essentially Hume's criticism of Paley's or, or of the of the the design arguments of of his day was how do you know that it's a single designer not multiple distinct designers. And I, I, the, to me, the, the response to that would be the fact that you see uh, a universality to biochemistry. Um, you have essentially two fundamentally distinct cell types. So there's a universality to um, cell biology, if you will. Uh, and um, you know, we, we see shared designs uh, throughout biology. So to me, that would be suggestive of a single designer not multiple designers thanks so much and this question coming in from let's see well actually next one erica if you want to read the next one from james downard after i read this quick one from nestlig 20 that i missed earlier they had asked for dr rana evolution they said evolution predicts specific mosaics but excludes others such as pegasus why do we only have ones that are predicted by evolution and none that are excluded? Um, so um, I guess the question I would have back, and, and maybe Jackson could jump in here, is I, I'm not so sure that evolution necessarily predicts specific types of mosaics, but rather in my experience, it seems as if people are discovering mosaics within the fossil record that would have a blending of characteristics that they then would argue is consistent with that being an intermediate form. So I don't know that somebody, you know, has set out and said, we predict these particular types of, of blending of characteristics. Have they? Have those yes. predictions actually been made? Diarthrognathus was one example who I know RJ is familiar with. It was an, a synapsid from the Triassic. Uh, this guy, Oh, I forget it. Beeb, William Beeb, predicted that uh, if mammals are descended from reptiles, and the cladistic people in the chat will tear me up over that, but I'm going to say it anyway. If they're descended from reptiles, then they're going to have a very particular jaw joint called a double hinge jaw joint, where you have these two mm. articulations between the jaw and the, and the rest of the skull. And so that was found as diarthrognathus. Um, uh, Archaeopteryx, actually, Darwin talked about uh, if there should be a, an ancestor of birds who had unfused wing fingers. And then just two years after origin, they found Archaeopteryx, which has unfused wing fingers. So yes, it, it does happen. Um, I think in the case of Tiktaalik, it was more like we're looking for something that's sort of fishy and sort of tetrapody in this time period. But yeah, for other ones like Diarthrognathus, it's, it's going to have these characteristics because it necessarily had to. It couldn't do otherwise. 
All right. So from RJ for Fuzz again, surprising all of us. Uh, RJ asks, what would an evolutionary precursor for chordates look like and how likely would it be to be preserved? What would an evolutionary precursor to chordates look like? Yes, and how likely would it be to be preserved? Um, well, uh, I, I don't know the answer to the first question. Um, and again, I, I have not given it thought. And so uh, just right here off the, off the cuff, I would, I'm not sure what that answer would be. But if I gave it some thought, maybe I could suggest some things. But um, uh, the, the idea of how likely is something to be preserved, I think is, is a tricky question, right? Because when you get into the taphonomy, the, the science of taphonomy, um, I mean, obviously things with, with you know, hard, hard uh, body parts are gonna be much more amenable to preservation than organisms that are primarily made up of soft body parts. But this is part of the, the I think the remarkable aspect of some of the, the Cambrian Lagerstatten is that you had these very rapid burial events that preserved, you know, organisms, number one with soft body parts and number two in a wide range of different orientations, which allowed for you know, reconstruction of the organisms in, in a remarkable way. So it's hard to know, uh, uh, you know, what its likelihood of, of preservation being, right? Um, so, I, you know, I don't know how to answer that question. Jackson, you got if, you've got any, if you've got any thoughts on that. Well, I'm, I'm mostly in agreement with you. Yeah, if you have hard parts, you're more likely to be preserved. If not, you're a lot less likely. And so, you know, you hope it's going to be preserved so we can find something really cool. But, but I mean, I think if it was a, you know, an evolutionary precursor to a chordate, the, the likelihood of it having a, it's going to, the likelihood of its preservation would be pretty remote. You got it. We are, want to say thank you to our guests. Want to say thank you to Erica for coming on as well to help. And I want to let you know, folks, if you have not already known and checked them out, all of the guest links are in the description. What are you waiting for? You can listen to them plenty more after this. And so we really do appreciate them. Also, oh, or also want to mention, folks, we will have a post credit scene coming up. And so want to say thanks, everybody, for your questions from the Q&A. Thanks so much for your support. It's always a great time. And want to let you know, again, no matter what walk of life you are from, we hope you feel welcome. And so thanks for hanging out with us here at Modern Day Debate. With that... As mentioned, and as usual, folks, keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Yes. Hold on. You missed one last super chat. This is from Josiah Hansen for $2. Merry Christmas to all. And then a, a, a inside call out to me for not forgetting something. So thank you, <laughs> Josiah, for the $2. Thank you. I, I did miss that. Appreciate that, Erica, having my That's back. Amazing. That's what I'm here to co-mod for. Come on. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. And so, yes, thank you very much, Josiah, indeed. And thanks, everybody else, for your questions, support, and everything else. So thanks so much. We will see you next time. Oh, by the way, you guys, I didn't even mention it. Yet next time will be tomorrow night as Erica will be coming on with her partner, mm -hmm. Dr. Cy Gart. will be back. Should be a blast. And that will be against good old Otangelo and Erica's truly best friend, John Maddox. So that should be a juicy one. That's it's right. Gonna real, it's going to be really fun, really civil. Um, it's going to be great. I'm really excited. No doubt about it. So thanks so much, everybody. We'll hopefully see you for that. And we'll be back in a few. Thanks so much. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable.
Folks, so thanks so much for hanging out with us. Just want to give a quick update on the Kickstarter. We are pumped, folks. We are excited as we are, as of right now, we are at around close to 50% of the way there. It's in the 40s somewhere. I can't remember exactly. But believe me, folks, that there is a very good reason for this. There are never, you could say several good reasons. In particular, one is this debate itself is going to be epic. And I know that you're like, hey, you know, I'm like, eh, it's like, okay, maybe I'll check it out. One thing I do want to mention is that if you're like, hey, you know, cool, is Christianity dangerous? I think that'd be fun. You're like, eh, I don't know, you know, like, what's the idea? Why a Kickstarter? Well, the reason is there are a lot of guests that we have never had on and we want to have on. And you could say that the Kickstarter allows us to make or take bigger risks. In other words, there are a lot of debates, folks. Uh, a lot of people don't know we already do you could say we could pay a pretty good amount for some of our debates. So, for example, it's not uncommon that we might pay in honorariums like $500. Uh, sometimes it might be $1,000. So, for example, like Ray Comfort versus Matt Dillahunty, that was a $1,000 debate. And oftentimes we, we get the, you could say the, the funds are replenished for the paying of the honorarium by ads and super chats and things like that. However, if we are doing big time speakers that might be asking, five thousand dollars for example that's a risk that it's hard for me to say it's hard for me to justify that we have had debates where sometimes we pay honorariums and, and we take a loss and it's okay because we've got super chats from other debates and stuff like that but if we want to go for these you could say bigger fish if we're going for these huge guests that might be like two thousand three thousand five thousand dollars and sometimes more for their speaking fees well we have to uh, find new ways that we can take those risks and kind of have a safety net. The Kickstarter is our way of doing that. If everybody puts in three bucks, let's say everybody in the stream right now, that by itself is a huge chunk of our goal. In other words, I think that that might be, that maybe be close to getting us, uh, that certainly put us, I think, close to two thirds of the way to our goal. And so this is kind of a strategy that we wanna see how successful will this be and the link to that Kickstarter is in the description, folks. So I want to say, if you pledge three bucks, you get to watch it live, and it makes sure that the debate actually happens. Because that's the trick, is that we have to reach our goal in order for the Kickstarter to kind of come through. Otherwise, if we don't reach the goal, nobody's charged at all, and there's no debate. And so if we want to take these bigger chances, if you'd like to see bigger uh, batter guests from all over the place. And don't get me wrong, we love our guests. We've had tremendous guests so far, no doubt about it. But in terms of seeing new guests, new awesome guests, new buzz saws in the debate world, this, I think, is the way that we're going to be able to do it. And so, do want to encourage you folks, if you have not yet pledged to the Kickstarter, it's coming quick, folks. It, don't let it sneak up on you. We do want you to for sure get to watch this debate live. So, it's on January 8th. So it's only less than a few weeks. I think it's like two and a half weeks. And so don't let it sneak up on you such that you might miss the live showing, folks. It's three bucks. That's a cup of a, you know, the price of a cup of coffee. That's the kind of thing that even if you were like, oh, I completely forgot. I don't know how you'd forget because this is an epic debate. But if you if you're like, ah, I forgot. It's like, ah, three bucks. Like, eh, who cares? I'm fine. So we've purposely made it as affordable as possible for people from all walks of life. And so, like I said, you could say that many hands make light work. In other words, if we spread the risk of paying out big speaker fees, if we spread that risk to many people, like let's say a thousand people are like, hey, I'm willing to put three bucks into this, a thousand people, that's $3,000. We can start getting newer, bigger, badder speakers from all walks of life. If you want to see those debates, like for example, I appreciate that. Slam is right. There is already $1,067 pledged of 2500 So we're close to that 50% mark. And praise I am that I am. It's just three bucks. Now, I, I want to mention, if you are a Patreon, if you're a Patreon, don't pledge any money. As a patron, we want to say thanks. You're already included. So you are already going to get your personalized link. And if you are not a patron, though, hey, consider joining our Patreon as you would automatically be in for the live show for that debate that is coming up between Michael Shermer and Inspiring Philosophy. And want to let you know, folks, 
this debate, it's going to be epic. There's another detail about it. So I had mentioned that we have the live showing for it. You can see it here on the screen. Right now I'm pulling it up. So right here you see at the top right inside of that red circle or oval, you see that it's three bucks. That basically allows you to watch the show live as it happens. It'll probably be released, I'd say, uh, you could say to YouTube publicly to the world uh, within a couple of days after. But like I said, folks, if you're like, well, I'll just watch it then. It's like, well, but it might not, it might not actually be, it might not happen at all if we don't have enough people putting in. And so do want to say uh, that not only allows you to watch the debate live, but it also allows you to watch the, or I should say, uh, makes the debate possible, period. And so do want to encourage you. There are other tiers. So for example, you can see on the screen right now, I'm zooming in on two of the other ones that are below, which is watch it live and make the event huge. If you put in $6, that helps us for our, we have a chunk of the pie, you could say, of our costs. Our, we are trying to make this big in terms of promotion. And so that also helps, you could say, give us an idea of how well will it work if we, let's say, try to have a debate between, I don't know, mega speaker Jordan Peterson and you know Sam Harris or whatever it is if we were to try to get those guests on and we see hey uh, look the advertisements actually worked really well because you can put out YouTube ads and if we do that and we find out like hey this actually works that again helps us make it more affordable for everybody so we are trying to test out a promotional or advertisement plan for this one and that helps support that if you give to that watch the watch the show live and make the event huge then you'll see below that it has let's see ten dollars your name on screen in the thank you list and so just like we have as you'll see on the screen right now you can see on the bottom here we have the uh, little patreon ticker which has the names Adam Elbilia, Steve Hosfield, Converse Contender, Nathan Thompson. Nathan Thompson is not even a Patreon member anymore. Get him out of there. No, I'm kidding. We hope you're well, Nathan. Uh, but basically that list is what that thank you list is referring to. There's another option. I think it's like 20 bucks is that if you put in 20, um, basically what it does is we will read your name out loud on screen during the, like at the end of the debate and just say like, you know, for example, thank you, slam RN or, you know, whoever it is, no pressure. Um, but yes, now solely De Deo Gloria says, can people donate through super chat and have the money go towards the debate? We thought about trying to do that. One of the challenges is that, um, YouTube takes 30% of the super chat. So it's kind of like, eh, it's just a little bit of a bummer where um, basically if you, let's say, gave $10, which is a generous super chat, it is, like $3 of it goes to YouTube. And it's like, ah, geez, you know, YouTube has enough money. Like, like we, So long story short, you might say, well, what about when you do those super chats where like we did it with uh, the Dr. Friedman, Dr. Wolf debate where it was a fundraiser and YouTube didn't take the 30%? They only let us do that if it's a nonprofit, and we don't have nonprofit status. There's like a number of hoops you have to jump through that we we don't have the ability to call ourselves that yet. Maybe someday we've thought about like should we go in that direction? We're not sure, um, but yeah. So anyway, it's like eh, yeah, I totally know what you mean, but um, it's not as easy as I'd like it to be regarding those soli uh, soli deo gloria. I appreciate the question though. Then uh, let's see. <clears throat> thanks for your guys' support though a lot of people are really positive about it that means a lot because a lot of people it's like they're they're excited about it they're like they buy into the vision that it's like hey we want to have a neutral platform we want to have a debate channel that doesn't have like an after show that just says oh my gosh so and so sucked so bad and that view is so stupid we want it to be truly fair if people in the comments or you know if the audience wants to judge whose case was most persuasive have at it it's a free country and you know you're happy you know we're happy to have you post those comments or whatever however at the same time uh we as a channel we want to be neutral and so long story short the only reason that i said that is if you buy in the vision which a lot of people have a lot of people have put big donations in believe me folks we're going to make this goal like i am determined i don't care if i have to do a car wash in January, we're going to make this goal. I guarantee it. I've got some people that I'm going to reach out to and say, hey, are you willing to put in kind of some bigger donations? 
some of those uh, backers, you'll notice, I think we've got like 35, 30 something uh, donors. We've got like a thousand bucks. That's because some people I've reached out to and I've said, hey, will you help us? You, you know, you've been all in for the vision. Are you willing to put in like, you know, a couple hundred bucks for this, maybe even a few hundred bucks? And some people really have. And so we really appreciate that. And I have also put in some cash to kind of help get the momentum going. And so um, it kind of, in a small way, I would say as long as we have enough help, it helps spread the risk out. Like I said, I just, uh, for big, big honorariums, we want to spread that risk out. And that's going to allow us to have people like, we do want to have, I always see Vosh's name comes up, Vosh versus Esha. I don't know who Esha is. But it sounds dank, and that's something that we'd honestly want to do in person. Um, Sticks and Hammer 666, we've, for real, no joke, I've, I've actually reached out for uh, two Sticks before. We've never heard back. But in order to, let's say, if we had Sticks and Vosh or somebody else in person, we'd want to get a good venue, and that's another thing that costs money. Um, we had a debate, one of our debates was free to the public. The honorariums alone cost, I think it was $1,000. Then the, and that's not including the travel costs. That's not including uh, the um, facility. So booking the place that we actually had the event at. And so it's like that stuff, it adds up, folks. And so that's why I know that you're probably like, James, why uh, a Kickstarter? Why do you want our help? The reason is that, like I said, We've had a lot of free debates that we trust that the super chats and the ads will replenish what we pay. But when it gets to these big time speakers that want big bucks, and understandably so, I mean they're popular people. They people want them all over the place. That's usually how op opportunity works. Is once you get a bit more bigger and more opportunities, you get additional big and additional opportunities. And so it kind of like snowballs and so it's like hey you know like i don't blame them like if they are like hey you know we need two thousand dollars to do a speaking thing with modern day debate and it's like yeah you're a busy person like i know like they get paid more than that by some places and so that's why it's like hey we want to try to kind of meet the speakers uh where they're at and so let's see to be fair i know that some like i try to be grateful uh let's see maverick says james sell your blazers well, I appreciate that you've noticed. This blazer, I think it's called Houndstooth. That's what uh, my the, my girlfriend Frankie told me. It's called uh, Houndstooth is the pattern. This is $5. Not trying to brag, but I shop at Goodwill. Only the best deals. You know, I'm always shopping at thrift stores. And so if I sold my blazers, that would give us $35 probably. <laughs> but but maybe. Hey, well, we'll think about it. I uh, appreciate that. You're, maybe, but you're right. Maybe, maybe like if I put it as a... Uh, a Kickstarter reward. I don't know if people are probably, why would you want my smelly old blazers? I don't know. But um, Colin Loren says, tell him daddy Trump is watching. Well, that's, I don't know what you mean. That's uh, I, I don't usually call other men daddy, but whatever. All right. Thank you. Soli Soli de Gloria says, think your answer was addressing being able to view the live stream. But my inquiry is more about just donating through super chat to secure the debate to happen. Right. Yeah. So Soli, uh, what I'm saying is, if you donate through, if you're kind of like, hey, can I make my donation through Super Chat? Like 30% of that gets taken by YouTube. And, and so we're saying that if you want to give the most for the, what, when, so that your donation actually is actually being used for what you want it to be used for, namely like supporting this project, then the best way to go, or a better way to go at least, is Kickstarter does not take a whopping 30%. They do have, like I think it's like 8% or 10% um, maybe total, but it's at least less compared to YouTube. And so we had mentioned that we do use, like we sometimes have debates where, uh, let's see, we have debates sometimes where it's like, yeah, we pay the speakers and we don't, it, you could say that we don't make up for it in Super Chats and ads. Um, on that particular debate and we use other super chats from other debates to try to fill in for that and so let's see invisible ninja says i just increased my pledge to 20 dollars. we can do this thanks so much we really do appreciate it and then 
Brian Stevens says, was it Ray or Matt wanting the 1,000? Oh, it was it was 500 each we paid him. Um, so Ray Comfort and Matt, I probably shouldn't say this because it's usually kind of like secret, but to give you guys an idea, I don't think they'd care anyway. It's not a big deal. I mean, that's the thing. I would defend our speakers and I would say they're popular people. Like they could get paid more than that. Uh, and so I always feel like we try to, you know, ask, you know, what can we, we try to kind of, uh, get a good, you know, you could say a good deal. And so, um, long story short, yeah, I mean, let's see. But yeah, thank you, Invisible Ninja, for your support. Seriously, it does mean a lot. And I am determined, folks, we're going to get there. I don't care what I have to do. Maybe I will sell my blazers. We're going to meet, reach this goal, believe me. And this is going to open doors for us, folks. I mean, if you want to see people, like, name your guests. I mean, like, no joke, like, Maybe someday Richard Dawkins or uh, Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson, William Lane Craig, whoever it is. I, like, if you, let me know who you want. Um, that's what we want to do. We want to take it big time. I, if you guys have seen these debates with like Jordan Peterson and uh, Matt Dillahunty or Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris, like they've been epic, huge debates. We want to go in that direction. Because we, one, think ideas are important. The exchange of ideas especially is important. We want people to kind of see those exchanges take place. And so Liliaja said, could you make me a mod on Twitch? I didn't know that Twitch allows that, but I will. Said, all you have to do is click on my name in the Twitch chat, and there should be an option. We're trying to keep things alive over there. Thank you, Liliaja, for that support. And I think somebody else was talking about Twitch, too. Um, let's see. Poor Erica. <laughs> like, I was like, Erica, I'm so sorry. I've got to go. Uh, we appreciate Erica. And she will be back tomorrow night. We, we really do enjoy Erica. Um, let me try to... Oh, one thing. So sorry. Lily Aja. I promise next time I will make you a mod on Twitch. I emailed Twitch asking for my password. They, I don't, I'm still waiting on the email. because I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know my own password. It's embarrassing. But... Want to say thanks so much. The Maverick says, I'll pay $50 at least for Jordan Peterson. Well, we want to have that. To be honest, folks, if the Kickstarter, like part of that eventually potentially happening is if we see that the Kickstarter strategy is effective. So if you feel like this channel has been uh, a joy to you and you're like, hey, you know, like three bucks is like a cup of coffee. That support means a lot. And it also shows us that Kickstarter can work because it shows that people are like, hey, yeah, you know, to see bigger debates and to see that this strategy actually works so that we use the strategy again to hopefully get Jordan Peterson or whoever, please do consider giving actually to the Kickstarter, which, by the way, last, I'm going to put that in the it's in the description. So if you have not already clicked on that Kickstarter link, I want you to know that it is handy. It is convenient. It is in the description. And we are up to about, it's at $1,097. So we're almost up to 1100 folks. Believe me, we're going to make it. I absolutely believe we will. And so I am determined. And so that link to the Kickstarter I just put in the chat. And so Lily, I just said, in the meantime, everyone should follow on Twitch. Yeah, they've been, um, let's see. Brenda says use a password app. They have those? I didn't know that exists. But, and I'm being serious, I didn't know that they, there's such a thing as that. Soli, thanks for your kind words, who said, love your, uh, love this channel. That means a lot, Soli. We, we do appreciate it. And we are on Twitch, which I just pinned in the live chat. So if you prefer Twitch, if you're like, James, I, I like this channel, but I wish I could watch it on Twitch, you can. It's already on Twitch. So whenever we're live, it should show over there. And so I think the word on the streets is that we can eventually, if we get enough subscribers, that Twitch becomes monetizable or something, which can help us get speakers as well. And so we do appreciate that, folks. We have a goal. I'm determined. Like, this is what I, I love doing this channel. I am passionate about it. It is fun. It's something that I just get, I'm happy to get up and just start shooting out emails and doing everything I can to help this thing go because it's just, I just think it's a blast. And so we do appreciate all of your support. And let's see, as I had mentioned, that Kickstarter, now I've lost, there it is, okay. I am pinning the Kickstarter to the top of the chat. 
And so do want to say we do appreciate that. And then Soli Dia Gloria says, I can I only use gift cards on Google. Therefore, Super Chats are my only avenue to give money. Gotcha. Well, your, your Super Chats mean a lot. It is, like I said, if we have a loss on a debate... Um, and by the way, like I am definitely investing into this uh, Kickstarter myself. I, I don't want to fund it. Like I don't want it to be too much me because that defeats the purpose. Like if it's like 75% me, uh, basically donating to the Kickstarter, well, it's like well that it doesn't really alleviate the risk very much in terms of getting those big speakers that might want three thousand dollars, let's say, in the future. And so that's why I am uh, asking you to join with me. And so let's see. Brenda says, use last pass or keep pass. I didn't know that. But pray for me. Thanks for sh hanging out with us. It says, happy birthday, Jesus. It must be in reference to Christmas. Let's see. I, I would guess. We want to say thank you so much, everybody, for hanging out with us. John Smith, Manic Pandas, thanks so much. Failed Education System 710, thanks so much for hanging out with us. And also, let's see. Brian Stevens, thanks so much for hanging out with us as always. And you you guessed it, Slam RN. Uh, it's been a long time person hanging out with us. We appreciate that. NC Servisto said, James, oh, you got me on Richard, lost me Peterson, and got me back on board with Matt. I will try to remember to pledge to the Kickstarter tomorrow. It's getting late, and I'm using a phone. Well, thanks for that. We really do appreciate it. And, folks, I'm telling you, we are going to make this. We haven't made 50% yet. Believe me. Sometimes you have to, I've learned in my life, I've been in enough, and you guys have probably learned this too, I've been in enough trialsome circumstances, enough hard circumstances that I was in them and I thought, is this going to work? Can we make it? Like, are we going to win this? Are we going to pull through? Like, is this going to turn out? And when I thought, you know, I felt deep down like, oh, the feeling tells me no, but you just keep pushing through. And sometimes things are their darkest just before the light breaks through the clouds. I'm telling you. So I, I don't think we're, you know, it's not that dark. We're at like about 50% almost. So we're, we're doing all right. I expect that a lot of people will probably sign up in that last week before the debate actually is live because there's more of a sense of urgency and, um, and also people kind of see like, well, we're close. We can actually get there. But uh, we do want to ask, hey, don't let it sneak up on you. Don't miss it. Please do check out that Kickstarter link in the description or that is pinned at the top of the chat. And so thanks so much, everybody. It'll, it's always a blast. We appreciate you. And so we will see you next time. We appreciate it. Hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday and we'll be back tomorrow night. I've got to get the event up still. That's the event for, let's see, Erica and Dr. Seigart against Otangelo and Maddox. Otangelo, are you still out there? Man. Otangelo. Yeah, Otangelo. I mean, Otangelo, where are you in the chat? Lilia just says, James, true. Manic Pandas says, hey, James. Hey to you as well, friend. And Slam RN says, okay, I pledged. Well, thanks so much, Slam RN. Seriously, we want to bring you high quality debates. We hope it's a value to you. We hope this feels like a community. I know that. I mean, it's natural. It's kind of hard to fight because I've always wanted this place to feel like a community where people would feel like, you know, it's kind of a place you belong. And everybody, I wanted them to feel that way. Um, but my point is that um, I know that sometimes it's it's like a debate channel. So not surprisingly, sometimes the live chat is quite fighty. In other words, people are sometimes doing battle. And uh, But we do nonetheless want people to feel welcome. I know sometimes it's rough and tumble here. Sometimes I feel like, I don't know if I've ever told you guys this, and I'm, you know, it's just the way it is. Um, sometimes I just feel like, we're, in a way, we're almost like, sometimes the, uh, the criticism we get uh, with the controversial topics or the speakers, sometimes I feel like we're a little bit of a, a black sheep uh, among the YouTube channels, especially ones that host apologists, Christian apologists and stuff. And so... It's not really what I was ever going for, but uh, we do, despite all of those things, we hope it feels like a community. We hope you feel welcome. We really do appreciate your support. I'm excited about the future, guys. Once the COVID restrictions lift, we want to use Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and other sources or links to host some epic 
debates. And so we really do, really do hope you buy into that with us. As I'm telling you, I'm determined. I'm crazy, folks. I'm crazy. And we're going to make it. So thanks for that. And then I thought I just saw somebody. Invisible Ninja said, can't wait to have you on David Feldman's show on the 4th. We will get you some. Oh, the chat moved on me. <laughs> get you some there get some get you some supporters thanks so much we really do appreciate that invisible ninja um that means a lot and so lena pow says otangelo and john versus erica tomorrow it's true it's going to be epic tomorrow so i'm pumped about that it's going to be a lot of fun and so brian steven says hit like everybody i just pinned that in the chat as well thanks for your support brian seriously it does mean a lot adam albilia says wednesday started here He's ahead of the curve, everybody. Don't tell the flat earth preacher that. He might not like that. I don't know. But or she? I don't know. Jonathan Guzman says, keep up the good work. Thanks, Jonathan. That seriously means a lot. Thanks, Amy Newman, for your support and your positivity. And then Will Mark Castro says, sick in the head, crew. It's true. I'm sick in the head. That's why we have all these controversial topics. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, but we uh we are I'm crazy. Um, Amy Newman says, I'm crazy too. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes you got to be a little crazy to push through and to do things that people think like, oh, are you sure you can do that? Are you sure that's going to work? Oh yeah, believe me, we're going to make it work. So thanks so much. We really do appreciate it, folks. And with that, whew, uh, I hate leaving. I seriously hate leaving. I'm supposed to be, I'm running late right now. I'm supposed to be somewhere, but I'm like... I just like hanging out here. So I just, it's nice to actually get to connect with you guys. Nephilim Free has arrived. Nephilim Free says, This channel is destined to become the foremost debate arena in the world. Mark my words. Thank you, Nephilim Free. That seriously means a lot. And seriously, no joke, that's what we're going for. I, I really do want this to be a monster platform. My dream, I know this sounds maybe narcissistic, but you know what? It's not a result of thinking that I'm special. It's a result of thinking that what's happening here with people from different walks of life and people being willing to engage with each other and that it's hopefully a neutral platform. I, that idea, I think, is special. I think it's something you don't see in the mainstream media. I hope someday, no joke, I hope someday that we are so big that CNN and Fox News, that basically people would be like, wow, it's like that's a, that's a big platform. And they'd be like, wow, it's like that people would be like, this modern day debate, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll be on TV someday. I don't know. I know it sounds crazy, but seriously, I have big aspirations. Shoot for the moon, land among the stars. So, hey, maybe we don't make it to be quite as big as we we dreamed of, but it's going to be big, folks. I'm telling you, I'm absolutely determined. I've got high hopes, and I am dreaming, and we're going for it. So, Slam RN says, but you are special. Appreciate that, Slam RN. Appreciate that. I love the positivity. Colin Lorenz says, cheers, James, with a heart. I seriously do appreciate that, Colin. Thanks for your positivity. That's a big thing, too, folks, is like, I thrive. I thrive off enthusiasm. I'm an, I'm an idea man, okay? And so I do love your guys' enthusiasm. I love your positivity. Because sometimes it's like people are like, Ugh, the, like this Kickstarter idea is stupid and I'm like hey say what you want like I got thick skin I'm going to keep going either way but you know what I love the positivity that's the kind of cool stuff where I'm like I appreciate that like like why don't you want to see big things happen like I think it's a win-win like everybody wins if we get to host these monstrous debates and so anyway thanks so much appreciate it folks we will see you next time I have to go I wish I could stay and so I'm excited to see you tomorrow night though so hopefully we'll see you back here tomorrow night if you have not yet hit that subscribe button. Please do, because then you'll have reminders of all of our debates that are coming up. And so thanks for that. We will see you next time.